Barcelona and awesome Prize of Israel. This is uh, Rabbi Simon Altef uh, speaking from Ohio uh, in a nice kind of uh, cooler weather today over here. We're not getting the heat as in uh, Texas. I hear Texas is pretty hot. Here it's uh, nice and cool today. We had a, a little bit of a heat last week but uh, it's cooled down which is good. Uh, welcome to the room. Uh, our uh, Pasha today is Pasha's Shoftim, a very important Pasha. We'll look at that, but before we look at that, we'll do the, uh, our little joke. A religious woman, upon waking up each morning, would open her front door. She would stand on the porch and scream, Praise the Lord. The infu- this infuriated her atheist neighbor, who would always make sure to counter back, There is no Lord. One morning the atheist neighbor overheard his neighbor praying for food. Thinking it would be funny, he went and bought her all sorts of groceries and left them on her porch. The next morning the lady screamed, Praise the Lord who gave me this food. The neighbor laughing so hard, he could barely get the words out, screamed, It wasn't the Lord, it was me. The lady, without missing a beat, screamed, Praise the Lord for not only giving me food, but making the atheist pay for it. So, uh, right, so the Pasha, uh, we'll come back to Pasha's shop thing, actually we can have a quick, a quick look at it, and uh, there's other things I want to look at as well, it's part of the Pasha, let's see, Pasha's, Pasha's, let me put it up over here, book of Deuteronomy, let me close the bar. So we did Rea last week, okay, Pasha's Shaftim. You will, okay, this starts with the the book of, let's go back and look, book of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 16, which starts with obviously the festivals of Israel, chapter 16, and we are in verses 18. And it says, you will make judges and officers in all your gates, which Yahweh power gives you throughout your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not distort the judgment, nor you shall regard a person standing, neither take a bribe, for a bribe will blind the eyes of the wise, and pervert the words of judgments. Justice, justice you will pursue, that you may live and inherit the land which Yahweh, your power, gives you. You shall not plant any tree as an Asherah image near to the altar of Yahweh, your power, which you shall make for you. Neither shall you set up any graven image which Yahweh power hates. Uh, chapter 17, you shall not sacrifice to Yahweh power any bullock or sheep wherein is blemish or any other defect, for that is a ritual defilement to Yahweh power. If there be found among you within any of your gates which Yahweh power has given you, man or woman, that has worked wickedness in the sight of Yahweh power in transgressing the covenant, and has gone and served other powers and worshipped them, either the sun or moon or any of the hosts of Shama'in, which I have not commanded, and it's been, it has been reported to you, and you have made diligent inquiries, and the report is true that ritual defilement has occurred in Israel, then shall you bring forth a man or that woman which has committed that wicked thing, to your gates, even that man or that woman, and shall stone them with stones till they die. All the mouth of the two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall be, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. The hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him, to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people. So you shall put the evil away from among you, if there rises a matter too hard for you in judgment between, between blood and blood, between plea and plea, and between stroke and stroke, being matters of controversy within your gates, then shall you rise and get up into the place which Yahweh your power shall choose, and you shall come to the Kohanim, the Levim, and to the judge that shall be in those days and inquire, and they shall show you the sentence of judgment. And you shall do according to the sentence which they of that place which Yahweh shall choose shall show you, and you shall observe to do according to all that they inform you. According to the sentence of the Torah which they shall teach you, 
and according to the judgment which they shall tell you, you shall do, you shall not decline from the sentence which they shall show you to the right hand nor to the left. And the man that does not pay attention and will not listen to the Kohen that stands to minister there before Yahweh of power or to the judge, even that man shall die and he shall put away the evil from Israel. And all the people shall hear and fear and do no more presumptuously. And we'll stop there for now. And we'll just go into the explanation a little bit of, of this. Is that here uh, a decree has been made that this is not just, this was being made whilst the tribes were outside the land and before they had entered the land. And of course, Yahweh said the place I'll show you. Now that place wasn't going to remain Israel. You see, another faulty uh, assumption that people make is that, oh, we were going to go to Israel and then the priests were going to be just there and that'll be that. And afterwards, you know, the temple is no longer there and the priesthood is finished. No. This judgment, this place that was spoken about is any place, anywhere in the world where the priest would live and any time of the, of the era between our restoration, between our dispersion, well, basically gathering, dispersion and restoration. Three phases that we are in. So we were in Israel and the priesthood was there to guide the people. Then we would, were you know, thrown out of Israel. Now the priesthood was outside Israel. And the temple was then broken by God's hand through, you know, through Gentile kings who came against Israel for because Israel was doing wrong things. So God sent the nations against them. They came and broke the temple, and, and then they destroyed the structure that uh, Yahweh had given them as a prized possession because they did not value it and they did not adhere to the precepts and the, and the commandments that Yahweh had wanted them to. At that particular phase, the Kohanim, the priesthood, obviously was now outside Israel, which means that they were equally important in outside Israel as well as within Israel. So today, in 2019, it goes to say that the priesthood is as important as it was back then, when the temple stood, when the tabernacle stood, when the commandment was given, and, and same way today. Now, God doesn't just say that you go to the priesthood for controversy. But God also says that you, you are to look after the priesthood in, in such as a, a demand is given. For instance, uh, if we go to, uh, I believe it's, <coughs> it's uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 19, where it says, Take heed to yourself that you forsake not the Levite as long as you live upon the earth. Now, I hasten to say, you know, without saying names or anything, just by the by. You know, you need to ask yourself a question. How many of you today, you know, listening to this broadcast, have actually adhered to that particular commandment in the Torah? Everybody runs around, Torah, 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 but how many of you actually adhered to it? How many of you have actually taken care of the Levite in the gate? You have a Levite in your gate today, in America. How many of you have come and said, you know what, this person is here, he's left his home, he has left everything over there in another country, we should support him. I, I guess that's a million dollar question. You know, people come to me with billions of questions, but when I ask them, when was the last time you tithe, and there are crickets in the room, then they don't answer. And then they'll say, oh, Rabbi, you know, oh, my business is not doing so great, it's a little tight, and blah, blah, blah. Then they give me all the excuses under the sun, but they don't want to tithe. So they claim, so their falsified claim is that I'm trying to keep the Torah, but yet they'll also say with the same, you know, forked tongue that I cannot support you because I'm sorry my business is a bit tight. So <laughs> look at the commandment and look at what you're saying. So did Yahweh say that if your business is tight, you should not support the Kohen any longer? So my question, a guy came to me, uh, recently, he's recently joined us, and he said to me, you know, he'd come to me, he's from a Christian background, obviously, he asked me a few questions, and I answered his questions, and I, I, and I asked him to get a, one of my books to, to address his concerns, and to listen, you know, to read it, and to study it, to follow it, and then if he's stuck, then he can ask me, and it will help his life. So he did, he purchased the book, and he went, you know, studying through it, and any questions he had, he came back and asked. 
So one day he comes to me and he asks me, he said to me, uh, Rabbi, uh, I, I have a problem. Can I call you please? Uh, and so I said, okay, uh, here is my telephone number. Call me tomorrow, etc., etc. So he called me. I think I was away from the phone or maybe busy with somebody else at the time. So then what happened, he uh, obviously couldn't get hold of me. I called him back. And uh, after I realized that he had, because I, see, I didn't recognize his number, and I don't pick up telephone numbers that I don't recognize, because you get so many phone calls coming in that are from these companies trying to sell you insurance, trying to sell you this, that, and other nonsense, and so I don't even pick up calls I don't recognize. And there's this idiot, you know, from Florida, who calls himself a Christian uh, prophet, and, you know, whoever this my number belonged to before, he basically uh, was blo- it belonged to a lady, some 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 girl, and he thinks he's leaving her messages, uh, telling her that he has prophecy of her and blah blah blah. You know, I blocked his billion of his numbers. <laughs> he keep changing numbers and and still sending messages. So I keep blocking his numbers. So anyhow, he's trying to sell his services which I don't need. And uh, having said that. You know, I could tell him a thing or two about about prophecy, but you know, this is a guy who's obviously thinks that he knows the Bible. He knows hardly anything about the Bible. Having said that, my point is this: that uh, I asked this man. This man said, said to me, "Could you please call me? I'm in I'm in you know dire straits. Uh, I need your assistance." So anyhow, I basically found him and I asked him, "What is the problem?" How is it that you need assistance? And he said to me that uh, he's having trouble. Basically, he's doing, uh, you know, he's trying to be a in in computer software, and uh, he's you know doing some kind of job there, and he's also doing an Uber job. And he said to me that you know Uber is part of his business, and so he's trying to get into the computer industry, and he's kind of got his foot into the door, and he's trying to make you know. Uh, make himself a bit better and try to get in there full time etc. So he's kind of doing two jobs right now. So he said to me that his his, his, his car was totaled in an accident and uh, you know he now has no form of income and that uh, you know that he's kind of obviously waiting for the insurance to pay up and then so he could buy another car and then get on the road again. So, you know, he was going along those lines and he said, what can I do to help myself? And I said, when was the last time that you actually paid a tithe to me, the Kohen in the gate? And, you know, he just went quiet because he'd never done it. He's, uh, he's, he's asked me questions quite a few times. I've answered him and, you know, and I explained to him that, you know, I don't answer questions for money. But there is actually a commandment in the Torah that says that you are to give your tithes 10%. When was the last time you tithed? And he said, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't, didn't know that. And I know I come from a Christian background and I know I should give something to the, you know, the point, the fact that I'm learning from you, etc. But I said that, you know, I will, you know, I will do something. I said to him, look, let me be very, fan, you know, honest with you once and for all. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm dependent on your money. I'm not. But I said that for your sake, Yahweh put a commandment into the Bible for your sake, not for my sake. And he said that you you must give 10% of your tithes. When was the last time you gave it? And you said you have not given it. So, do I get surprised that your business is suddenly collapsing around you? Think about it for a second. Why is your business collapsing around you? You had a flourishing Uber business, you know, you're doing desktop support in a, in a company and you're trying to further your career, all great stuff, very good, I'm happy for you, but why is it collapsing? Have you ever asked yourself that question? And he said, that's the answer I'm seeking from you. And I said, the answer is very simple. You have stolen from Yahweh, you did not give your tithe, and so Yahweh is blocking your finances. That's the answer. I said, you're not going to like my answer. But that actually is the answer. So, you know, he realized his mistake and he said, well, okay, you know, I understand what you're saying and I know that I've got to fix myself and I will slowly, surely, you know, fix myself. I said, fair enough. But I said, let me tell you that Yahweh can only bless you through what you put into 
the, uh, you know, into the commandment. I said, you want to be blessed from nothing. Nothing only yields nothing. I said, if you put one dollar, then you want it to yield ten dollars, that's basically, you know, to me, that's thousand percent. You know, if you want to put one dollar and you want it to yield a hundred percent profit, you'll get two dollars back. If you want to put a one dollar and get ten dollars back, that's like yielding thousand percent. I said, then you got to lay down your tithe because Yahweh will use that to multiply your blessings. If you do not give, there is no multiplication. There's only, there's only a subtraction. I said, what you have done for yourself by being, you know, by doing the things you've done, you only subtracted yourself out. Sadly, I said, sadly, I have to tell you that. Because, you know, I don't like telling people these things. I like to tell people, you know, what is, you know, what is a blessing and how to get blessed. And I said, I've told you, and I would like to tell you politely, I'm not being angry with you in any particular way, because you're, you know, coming from a different background that you don't know. So I'm telling you politely that you don't give, you don't receive. Because what you put into Yahweh's coffers, Yahweh owes you that money, and Yahweh will multiply it. If you put one dollar in, He'll multiply it to whatever He desires. He can multiply it to two, He can multiply it to five, He can multiply it to fifty, or even a hundred. It's up to Him. I don't dictate what He multiplies it with. So I said, let me say a simple question. If you earn a hundred dollars, you give ten dollars tithe, what do you give? Probably nothing right now, zero. So I said, what is zero plus zero? Equals zero. So I said, now you wonder why the, suddenly the car totaled, why suddenly the job is having difficulty in the desktop side, support side, and why you're not advancing. I said, I will tell you very simply that you need to let open your finances a little bit towards God's kingdom. You haven't done that. You haven't kept the Torah properly. You're not in compliance. You will struggle and you will pay with struggling. And I believe me, when I tell you struggling, it will be real. It won't be just some kind of fanciful idea. So I said, my suggestion to you is to look at your finances and take out some zedakah and give it until you can start paying your tithe out of your proper finances. If you don't, you will struggle even more to the point where you might even lose your marriage. Because now it's just the finance. Tomorrow will be your wife will be saying, you don't make enough money, I'm going to go divorce you and look for another man. So I said, these things are all on the horizon right now. So my suggestion, I will tell you a few things that you need to do. If you follow me through, then you will prosper. But you must follow me through. So he said, okay, Rabbi, I will do what you tell me. And then he started to fix himself. That was only one story, by the way. Then I had another story. Another man who owns a trucking business. Listen to this. This man owns a trucking business. He's not poor. He can come to Ohio to purchase a truck. Now, you folks know more than me what is a truck's value in Ohio. I mean, talking about a, a semi. What is the value of a semi? I mean, come on, you know, you guys probably, um, there's a person in this room who used to do business in semis, you know, used to own a business. She will probably tell you what the value of a semi is. So this person, he sends me at least two to three questions a day asking questions on different aspects of the Bible. But when it comes to the tithe, there's crickets in the room again. And then one day, I had to actually ask him, I said, look, you know, you're trying to keep the Torah. When was the last time you tithe? And he's like, Rabbi, I'm sorry, business is a little tight. So he can afford, to, so yeah, I'll thank you for that. So he can afford to buy a $150,000 truck, a semi, but he cannot afford to give 10% tithe. That to me is a shameful act. I must say it's a shameful act. Because... You know, <laughs> come on, you know, I mean, think about it. This guy is stealing from God. And so I told him, I said, listen, I'm going to tell you once and only once. If you continue to steal from God, you will befall many problems in your business. I suggest you look carefully at your business and you decide whether you want to prosper or whether you want to go the, down the road of, you know, zero benefit. So you think about it. And he said, okay, Rabbi, you know, I will look into that. See, these are the kind of people I have to deal with. So they want, you know, they want God to bless them. They want to get the heavens pouring into their, into their lap. But you know what? They don't want to give a dollar to God. That's their, that's their mentality. So, anyhow, you know, 
I just laugh and I just laugh because I think that I'm dealing with stupid fools you know, around me. People who claim to be wanting to be in the Torah, but they, they, you know, they, they completely deny God's laws around them. So, and sometimes I feel sorry for them. Why do I feel sorry for them? Because I think that the text is right there, but you don't want to see that text, and you're chasing after this, that, and the third. In other words, I'm not saying that he can't have a great business. He can have a great business. And may God bless his business greatly. No problems about that. But if that person is going to talk to me about Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, or is going to ask me a question about Book of Revelation, or some other question he's interested in because, you know, his friends are into Christianity and he wants answers, then where is the regard for the Kohen in the gate? Where is that regard? Am I supposed to be a dictionary over here? You just dial up the dictionary, you know, dial, you know, 111 and get all the answers you want and pay nothing? Even, you know, even a public service won't let you do that. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a little annoying sometimes that people just dial your number and they want answers, but they are refused to give from what Yahweh has given them. That's my point. You know, that's where I am right now with most of these people. And, uh, and so, you know, maybe a time will come, I'll stop, I'll, I'll, I won't even answer their calls. I refuse to take their calls after that. So, you know, it's a phone a coin and get an answer, but then, you know, when you say to them, aren't you supposed to be compliant with the Torah? There are certain aspects, it's not only tithe, there's other things, there's tithe, there's other car, there's keeping the festivals, there's adhering to certain food laws, there's adhering to certain customs of our, traditions of our in the home, are you doing all of that? And if you're going to tell me, Rabbi, it's a little hard, then what the heck are you doing over here? Then get lost and stay out there in the Gentile world and live your life and, you know, go to wherever. I don't care. You can go to Mars. I couldn't care less. Because my care, my concern is to bring you into the compliance of the Torah so that you can be blessed abundantly. That's where I stand. My, my role is not to say, oh, just give me tithe. No, my role is to make sure that your family is compliant and that God can abundantly bless you so that you're never short of money. That's where I am. But you see, if you are going to tie my hands behind my back and say, Rabbi, I'm stuck like Chuck and I can buy a $150,000 truck, but I cannot give you nothing because I'm sorry, I am got nothing. Eh, eh, eh. You know, that's going to tell me, so I'm going to tell you, eh, eh, eh. Yeah, I've got nothing for you either. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> so it's going to be funny that way. So my point is this that try to be compliant. You know, don't tell me that you got a job, but you can't give $10 to Yahweh because you can't, you're struggling. So you can pay your bills. You can pay your, you know, TV subscription to watch TV and cable and all that. You can pay for your phones and talk to your friends, but no, when it comes to God, oh, no, 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 I'm tight. I haven't got money for that. So, I think we need to, all of us that are doing that, we need to come back to ourselves and ask ourselves, are we being forthright with God? Are we stealing from God? And if we are stealing from God, is it the right thing to do? Because God doesn't allow that kind of thing to happen. And believe, believe me, you know, these people are not the only two individuals that are having these problems. There are a number of individuals having this problem. There was a particular rabbi that we ousted, I ousted, basically I, I removed him from the list in Philippines. He is another one who came to me a while ago, last year I believe it was, and he wanted me to lend him $2,000. And he had not given, no, I had received nothing from him in the last previous two years, not a zero from him. I had sent him Bibles, books, you name it, I sent it. And Rabbi Kifa is witness to that. And yet this person did not send a dollar in, even as a zadakah. So my point was, eventually I, to, I told him to leave, and he basically resigned himself, because he happened to go join a Christianity movement. And that's where he will live in the Christianity movement for the rest of his life. And we, we have no, uh, no way and of no particular authority. So, if you're not grateful to God for what God has done to you, then God is certainly not going to be begging you to please stay with me. God, God doesn't beg no one to stay. So, you know, God has given everybody a free will and choice, and they can do what they like, and they can, you know, be on their merry ways. Uh, and, and God has plenty of people that God can, you know, uh, reach out to and help, and and they and they in turn do bless God. 
They do. And, 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 you know, God knows who they are and God knows how to bless them. So therefore, I am absolutely not surprised when people who misbehave badly with God and yet they expect God to bow down to them and, you know, worship them instead of Him being worshipped. It's the other way around. So I think it's a high time that people understand that this Pasha Shroff theme is about judges. It says that you set up a judge. What's the purpose of a judge? Well, we know that the, you know, in the past we had a judge practically from every tribe. You know, all twelve tribes produced judges. As you know, Samson was a judge, a famous judge. You know that uh, the prophet Samuel was a famous judge. So, you know, these are the judges and we know they were kings. And when there was no kings, there were judges before that. And so the Levites, they also enacted, they also played the role of judge, prophet and priest. They played all three roles. And so therefore we have to say that a judge can only issue authority where authority is due. Yesterday I was watching a movie, an uh, Indian movie. It has been a long time since I watched an Indian movie. Yesterday I put one on. I thought, let me put an Indian movie on, see what's on, on the Indian side. And it was a movie about 1970s. It was based on true events that happened in India. And it was the time of Indira Gandhi and her son. And they basically, my goodness, it was so much wickedness that they did in their little government that they suppressed the people, they forcefully uh, sterilized the people. They forcefully uh, made them sterile and they threw them out of their properties, you know, these little, these, these little uh, ghettos they were living in. They, they bulldozed them for rich people and they threw them out so that rich people could build hotels and stuff. And eventually, eventually what happened, this lasted, I think, a, a, a good, was it two or more, no, actually more than two years. And uh, it was called the Emergency Act. You can read up about, on it, about on it on um, uh, on Google, MISA. Read up on MISA, MISA Act in India. And they did that in the 70s. And my, I couldn't believe my e, you know, eyes. Of course, I had to because it happened. I, even I wasn't aware of this, that, that her government was so corrupt and so awful that it did so evil to the people in India that it, that, you know, it, 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 uh, over a million people were dehoused, removed from their housing. Over, a, you know, a hundred thousand people were forcefully men. You know, men were made sterile, forcefully. And uh, then, you know, you had other things going on during that time, which is terrible. And so, eventually what happened, the mistake she made, because, you know, an evil person will always make a mistake. And when they make a mistake, boom, they are going to be dead. And so that's what happened. She made a mistake. She basically, they sent in the, the police or the army and they uh, went to the Sikh temple, which is one of their holiest places in India. And they, you know, kind of like went in with boots. Now you think about it. If that was our temple and you went in with boots like the Romans did and you tried to, you know, destroy the altar or do something, so they did that. They went in there with boots, which is not permitted in the Sikh temple because it's a religious area for them, it's a you know, holy area that they believe in, and they, you know, they demolished their, uh, some of their places inside, they hurt some people badly, and uh, forcefully, and then what happened, there were two guards who belonged to the Sikh religion, and by the way, Sikh people are very good people, I've worked with these people, they're nice people, they're not, you know, they're not hostile people, and so, you know, they were nice people and they were minding their own business. They believe in God and they were doing their own thing in their temple. And what happened was that these police that went in, you know, did disturbance, destroyed their, uh, you know, their uh, holy artifacts. And then what happened, there were two bodyguards to Indira Gandhi, the Prime Minister of India at the time. And they were both Sikh. Well, guess what's going to happen? They turned on her and they shot her to death. You know why they shot her? Because they said, you have... You know, you have desecrated our shrine, and you have desecrated our people. You have, you know, stomped on them. We're not going to let you live. So they killed her. And then later, you know, they, one of the persons was shot dead in the fight, and the other one was arrested and put to death, hanged. But the Sikh people to this day, they call them the heroes of their, of their, uh, of their community. And, and rightfully so, because I tell you, they did a righteous act. Because they put this woman to stop, because this woman was killing people left, right and center, sterilizing them, throwing them out of their homes, all under the guise of 
good governance and saying that oh India's population is too much we need to control the population and using that ploy they were destroying people's lives they were destroying families children you know so many people they killed there's a whole history behind it and India went through a real dark time at that time so eventually these two guys Sikh guys put a stop to this woman and that was the end of that dynasty thank goodness for that you know I thought that was a great thing that they did and uh, my point is this that whenever evil rises and evil people will always make a mistake and then they will be struck down they will not last you know and evil cannot continue evil will always be overcome by good remember that always evil will be overcome doesn't matter doesn't matter whether it takes one year two years five years one day boom evil will be overcome somebody will rise up and say that's it you know I'm gonna take action with my own you know with my own hands now so her own personal bodyguards shot her to death and put an end to her misery, miserable life for once and for all but having said that you know I mean I don't even know who Indira Gandhi was as a person I'd heard stories about her but I never really looked at it but when I looked at this history I was like very sad history I thought this is really sad you know that how this woman betrayed her people and how she misbehaved and, and took lives of innocent people and put them through such hardship that is totally unnecessary so my point is this that you know evil has a limited time and evil will always be overcome by good because as the saying goes you know a, a good person cannot just stand by when evil is occurring somebody will do something and so so my point is is that this is why in the Bible as well we, our stories in the Bible our ancient stories illustrate the point that judges whole point the judges are there to make sure that the people are looked after and that they provided correct judgment and decisions so that so that innocent people may not be stomped upon and poor people will not be treated badly because it says in our books that do not uh, do not take bribes and it says do not treat people indifferently in other words do not f put favoritism above other person and do not treat a rich man better than a poor man because if you do then you're going to pervert judgment there's a clear commandments that we live by so it is very important to understand that we as a people of the books Benai Israel we do not go around uh, you know making funny laws or, or or putting you know restrictions on our people so that they can be su suppressed this idea doesn't exist within our body of believers and, and our, our body of leaders should never exist so hence why my point is this that let me give you a simple example I'm going to give you an example using Rabbi Kifa. Rabbi Kifa's wife is about to have a baby, uh, probably in a week, so you know they're going to be uh, a proud mother and father. Now there are certain commandments around childbirth, as you know. You know what happens when a woman gives birth to a son, and what happens when a woman gives birth to a daughter. There are commandments around that. I won't go into those commandments. There are what, there are some other uh, customs around it which you probably have never heard of and I will tell you what those customs today are there are two customs that are prevalent that we have always done and that the Bible does not really speak about but actually they are there number one when a child is born if it's a boy two sheep must be given for that boy if it's a girl one sheep must be given now there's one lamb or two lambs two lambs for a boy they must be, they must be butchered slaughtered and they must be distributed to the people this is to be done for every boy that is born in our midst and same for a girl that by the way is a tribal custom that we followed for eons of ages and this custom is followed in every Muslim country because the Muslims many of them belong to the tribes of Israel and they know this custom and it doesn't have no bathing this custom did not originate in Islam but it actually originated much much many many years prior from the Bible same as a, as a circumcision custom and commandment existed in the Bible in the Torah and not in the Muslim holy book because they don't have a mention of it in their book but they know that it comes from the sources of the Torah so they do that as well they do the circumcision of the son and they also do this custom of sacrificing two sheep they, they bring, bring two sheep I remember my dad telling me he said when you were born me and my other three brothers he said for each brother 
When you were born, I gave two sheep for you, two sheep for your uh, three brothers, eight sheep, and then those eight sheep in total for my for, for my other, you know, me, my uh, my brothers included. So I said to my father one day, I said, where is mention of this custom in our in our you know in the Holy Quran? And he said that there isn't any. He said this is a custom that comes from eons ago, and this is mentioned somewhere else. In other words, he was talking about the 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 the, the Banai children, you know, the children of Israel's books. So I said, okay. So I looked into it. So yeah, he was right about that. So my point is this: that this is something that Rabbi Kifa is going to have to do. Is to uh, and I was thinking, how will Rabbi Kifa enact this in in San Antonio? So I, and I came up with a, a interesting idea: is that when Rabbi Kifa's son is born, you know, good and well. He will take two sheep and he will have them slaughtered by the butcher, local butcher, and he will go in and give the meat over to the all the people, whether they are Mexican, whatever, you know, just distribute them, uncooked. You know, because I, I went to San Antonio and so saw people sitting under bridges, on these roads, you know, people were looking for jobs. He could just go distribute meat to them. And that will be acceptable, by the way, in the sight of God, as Cohen has instructed that this can be done. So I have already passed the instruction to Rabbi Kifa. The other instruction of Pastor Rabbi Kifa is that he must buy a ring, a gold ring, that he's going to put on his son's, you know, uh, a left hand side arm on the ring finger. And it will be a gold ring, which will be a, a, like a give thanks to God, and it will be like a beautification of his son, and it will go on his ring finger, and it will be for everybody to see that God has blessed him with the son, and it is also to, to enhance and to encourage the child and to show that the family is grateful that God has given him a son. Apart from that, apart from that, by the way, there are, as you know, commandments in the Bible that what a woman is supposed to do postpartum uh, pregnancy. In other words, Kifa, in Kifa's case, it, it will be, you know, in the in the daughter's case, in the son's case, there is a commandment in the book of Leviticus to, to give certain offerings. And those offerings are separate on top of that. So these... So I've given you now custom, and I've given you commandment. Now I I can guarantee you that you probably have never heard of the ring one, and you've never heard of the two sheep one. But that actually exists in our midst, by the way. And we do that religiously uh, in our people. We do it religiously, whether we are in faith or whether we are out of faith. Everybody does that. So uh, I would only say that thank God for the Muslim world because I did not lose that custom. Everybody else, Christianity per se, has no idea about such things. They're clueless of what we do. Just like our president says, our, you know, the Fed is clueless. You know, he says that Mr. Powell is clueless whether to, you know, lower the interest rates or not. He should do it. So every other central bank is lowering their interest rate. So only our central bank is clueless. And I, I have to say that here our president is correct. Unfortunately, or fortunately, president is right. So the same way, we have many custom commandments that many people are clueless about why we do them and how we do them. So, thank God for Kohen in the gate that God sent over here that He may teach the people that may, they may bless the name of God and we'll look into that as well. Now, having said that, you know, you might think, well, maybe the Kohen in the gate is a little biased against Christians. And I'm certainly not biased against Christians. Why? Because Rabbi Kifa will tell you that he used to go to prior to becoming part of his role where he belonged, he used to go to John Hagee. And John Hagee, as you know, is a, a pastor in San Antonio, very popular. I remember his programs used to come on TV in one of the, whether it was TBN or God Channel, his program used to come on, in TV, and I used to sometimes see his 12 o'clock broadcast. He's a very lively character. You know, he'll always talk about some kind of prophecy related with Israel, and uh, yeah, always about Israel. It's a very lively character. You know, it's a very lively character. <laughs> I used to watch. I used to like watching him. He's a little bit of a comedian as well. So, but you know, having said that, if somebody wanted to go to John Hagee, let's say you lived in San Antonio, and you said, "Hey, you know, I want to go to John Hagee because I like him. He's a good character. He's lively." I say, "Yeah, sure. Go to him. Go, go listen to him. Go spend time with him." You see, if you wanted fellowship, if you wanted Social fellowship. Social meaning you want to meet other people, similar gathering of social social people. I'd say, yeah, sure, go and see John Hagee. He's a you know, he's kind of a lively character, good guy, throws in a few jokes as well. 
pretty pretty good, not bad. But if you ask me that what about what he teaches, how much it does it bear to the truth, I'll probably tell you maybe you're looking at 90-10. You know, 90-10, uh, 90% all wrong and 10% truth. So that's probably what I'll tell you. But my point is, he said, if you wanted to go to if you wanted to go to church, and he said to me, that boy, would you recommend a church for me? I said, yeah, go to John Hagee. You'll get some good time over there at least. And if you said to me, what other church can I go to? I say, in Houston, I say, go to, uh, what's his name? Uh, the, the lively character there, uh, Rabbi Kifa, you probably know him, Joel Osteen. I say, go to the, Joel Osteen's church. He's a lively character as well. My point is this, that I do not stop people from going to church. And I haven't in the past either. I haven't said to people, don't go to church. You see, church will give you social gathering. If you want social gathering, sure, go to church. But if you wanted truth, if you wanted to adhere to Torah laws, then the church do not teach those Torah laws. They don't have them. They don't even adhere to them. They don't believe in them. Then you're going to find that you're going to struggle to go to church and learn Torah laws because they don't teach them. But if you wanted social gathering for yourself, for your children, yep, sure, go to John Hagee, go to Joel Osteen. I like Joel Osteen. He's a good guy. You know, he throws in some nice jokes. He sometimes talks some good stuff. So I do like him as well. But my point is this, that, but he doesn't teach Torah. He does not teach you the laws of God. He'll teach you basics. And basics are like maybe 10% right and, and 90% wrong. Or maybe he won't even touch the 90% because he'll say, you know what, I won't even go there because that is not my domain. So he don't even go there. So therefore, I'm not going to criticize them because that's what they are taught. They are taught in their seminaries to only go so far where they're not crossing the line into, into you know, the commandments of God. I remember, I used to run a service in London and we got this place from a, a Baptist, I believe, it was a Baptist hall. And they gave us their hall uh, on Saturdays for a Sabbath service. This was in London, by the way, years ago. And uh, not that many years ago, maybe six, seven years ago. And uh, what happened was that one day, you know, we put the commandments outside. We put the Ten Commandments outside. And you know what? One day we went into the, the, the church to do our service. And they told us we couldn't do our service because they did not like us putting the Ten Commandments board outside. Think about it. They hated the fact that we put the Ten Commandments board outside on the road. That's how ridiculous this statement was that the church guy said, we do not like the fact that you put the Ten Commandments outside. We don't believe in them. Now, you tell me, what will you do with that statement? So I, so I said to the people, I'm sorry, the church is disbanded. We're not going to meet here any longer. That's it. It's the end of this church. So we stopped meeting over there altogether. So this is a church ideology. They do not like God's laws and they do not adhere to anything that God says. In fact, in fact, I will go so far as to say that the very character, the very person they claim as their Lord and Savior, Jesus, they do not adhere to His commandments either. So that's the problem that we are dealing with. We're not dealing with one side of the fence. We're not saying, oh, Old Testament. We're saying even New Testament theology, which points back at, at you know, festivals. It talks about the festivals of God. It talks about the commandments sometimes. But do they adhere to it? No, they don't. They don't even adhere to what Jesus has said. So therefore, I mean, it is no more than a social gathering. Church is no more than a social gathering. Sadly, sadly I have to say that. You know, unless you can show me a church that teaches the, you know, the, 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 all the laws, and I'll say, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, maybe this is one I missed. But I don't think I missed any. Uh, this is what you will probably find. It's not the way. So, now... Bearing that in mind, this is why I don't have no, you know, I have nothing to fight with Christians about, and I have nothing to argue with them about. You know, if they want to do their service Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever, no problem. I got no, I got no problems with it. They can do that. I'm completely neutral about it. As you know, I, I, I put out the neutral meditation for the very fact that you can become neutral to these things. You don't need to hate them. You don't need to love them, and you don't. You can be just in the middle. Look, you know, I don't mind you do, I don't mind you don't do. It's okay, I'm just neutral. I'm going to say nothing about it, but you know, it's not going to get anywhere, but I'll just stay neutral. My point is that there's nothing there for me. 
And I'm pretty sure that most of you have already been there, done that, got your t-shirt and said, you know what, there's nothing here for me either. So this is the point, but if you want to go there for fellowship, sure, you know, go there for fellowship. You know, if I wanted to go for fellowship, I was talking to somebody, you know, they're saying that if I wanted to go to fellowship, I'd go to a bar. I'd get better fellowship over there. <laughs> and I was like, fair enough, yeah, why not? You know, if you go to a bar, so be it. So having said that, that's fine as well. So social life, ab absolutely, when Kuni, there's social life everywhere else because you know, that's why the person said they go to buy. And I agree with that. I said, yeah, sure. I mean, I probably would do the same thing. You know, if I want social life, I'd go to a bar as well. <laughs> I'm not going to go look for social life in a church. There's nothing there for me, unfortunately. So having said that, I get more social life in my gym than I'll get in the church. To be honest, you know, I go to the gym, I get more social life over there. At least I can talk to different people who go to the gym, and I'm happy with that. So, you know, I can, I can build some muscle and I can, I can build some stamina and, and I can also, you know, uh, chat to some of the people who are, you know, goers of the gym for, I don't know, donkey's years, long, long, longer than I've been going in, in the gym over here. So that's, that's basically where I am. So coming back to the, some of the questions, you know, because people find uh, the, you know, some of these things difficult in the New Testament and they ask me and they say, well, what does this mean in the New Testament? How do I reconcile that? So there was a question that came in regarding Revelation chapters 20 verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And they said to me, uh, how do we reconcile that? Because devil was deceiving everybody in the lake of fire, and the brimstone, and, and the beast, and the false prophet, etc., etc. I said to them, well, last time I checked, Last time I checked, I said, you know, which wasn't too long ago, <laughs> it is pretty recent, like today. <laughs> so I said, the devil is still very happy, he's very free, and God is about to give him a bonus. Guess why? Because he did a fantastic job. I said, do you think that God is going to put the devil into this allegorical place, which is allegorical, by the way, it's not literal. So do you think God is going to put him in this allegorical, symbolic place to punish him when he's a servant of God, and he's a top agent? You know, he's an archangel. He's going to be given bonus for doing a great job. Think about it for a second. The person was shocked to hear this. It's like, oh goodness, I didn't see it from that angle. I said, yeah, that is the angle I'm going to give you. That the devil, you, you call the devil, is actually Hasatan. He's an angel of God and he's subservient to God. He's called the son of God as well. To die for that, Rabbi Kifa. Yeah, he's called the son of God as well. So I said, you think son of God, the son of, you know, a son of God, a, a angel, a archangel, not just any angel, any Joe Blog angel, he's an archangel. I said, an archangel, God tells him to go do this, and he go does it fantastically. What do you think he'll get? Bonus. Not in the pit of hell and all this nonsense that you, you are believing from Christianity. I said, these phrases are symbolic, and they must be treated symbolically. Because there's no such thing as beast and, you know, false prophet. I said, look, the Christian church has been teaching fear mongering for generations. And they teach in Europe. I sat and I heard with my own ears and I read it in their books that, oh, the false prophet is a pope. He's going to go to hell. He's the Antichrist and blah, blah, blah. And on it goes. I said, how many popes have come and gone? So how many false prophets are right now in hell, so-called hell? How about zero? None. Because the whole thing is allegorical. So, let's forget about that. And let's talk about the beast. The beast is a, is a people. It's talking about people. And those people are not in hell either. So I said, we cannot take allegory and apply it physically. Then the next scripture I was given was this one. Let me, let me bring this one to your past. It was uh, Matthew 25, 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 46 And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Again, this statement is entirely biblical and again, is entirely allegorical. Surprise, surprise. Oh, allegorical, I didn't realize that. Because do you think that God who creates his, his children, the very creation he's made, man and woman, and the whole generations thereafter. Do you think he will enjoy putting them into a, some kind of a fire and torturing them and be laughing? Ha 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 ha. See? See I told you you're going to be burning to hell. No. Because God is not like that. 
these kind of images were created by the Christian church, the Christian clergy. The, their forefathers they created these ideals that there is a punishing place and there is a you know heavenly place and you can go to the punishing place and be punished and this is what the, this word proves it. No, Matthew does not prove it. I said to him, I asked him one simple question. Because, you know, I always like to ask a question based on what they are reading. I said, could you please show me a relevant verse in the first five books of Moses which say that people were put into hell because they were wicked and evil. Can you show me one? There was silence in the room. In other words, there is nothing in the Torah that says that there is actually a place created literally called hell or heaven for that matter. So that brings everything into question. Why? Because the Sadducees, who were by the way part of the priesthood in the ancient temple, because the priesthood, priesthood fell into both Sadducees, they were also Sadducees, and they had two sides of the coin. They basically believed, some of them believed in heaven and hell. Others did not believe in heaven and hell, by the way. They believed there is no heaven, no hell, no angels, etc. So, no, Dante is not correct. Dante was another idiot who just painted paint this stuff based on church theology. So, so having said that, having said that, my point is very simple. If there is a heaven, and if there is a hell where people are tortured, then there should have been a mention of that in the book of Genesis, in the book of you know Exodus, in the book of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Where is it? I don't find any. So, the rest is commentary, by the way. If you're going to tell me prophets, and if you're going to tell me uh, book of Revelation, I don't care what the book of Revelation says, because it has to be in the first five books. That is law. That is where everything is resting. And if it's not in the law, it cannot be taken as seriously. And any, any place else. This is why there is still a sect today in Israel called the Samaritans. To this day, they only follow the Torah, only the first five books. They do not care about anything else. And I don't blame them, because guess what? The more books you introduce, the more confusion you're going to bring in, because they're going to start talking about different things, and the people are going to get confused. Then you can start interjecting, and you start making up new doctrines and dogma and dogmatic situations and you know, si uh, solutions. And guess what? Before you know it, you put the pe people into fear and subjugation. And I can see why they don't want to do that. Perfectly fine, they don't want to do that. So. What about where God lives? You may say, hey, Rabbi, what about where God lives? Isn't that heaven? Yes, it is heaven. It's a, it's a place where God lives. It's the eternal abode. But it is not a place where humans go to live. So we have to understand that. Where God lives, where God's abode is, because God is a special kind of light, or lights, plural. We cannot dwell in that place where God dwells, because we are human beings. God is not a human being. God is different. So, where the dwelling of majesty is, we can but, we can but from a distance perceive it. Even the angels are feared to go into that place. You know, they, they cannot stand before God. Because it's such a strong light, even they can't take it, and they have to cover their eyes. What do you think will happen to humans? We'll probably perish. So, it's not possible to live there. So, the Bible always speaks about visions. In visions, people see God's light, or they may see God in some other form like maybe a human form, but, you know, they do not go and stand before God. They, they stand before God in a vision. In a vision you can, but in real life, forget about it. You'll, be, you'll become cold if you stand before God. So when people say, oh God, please come to me, please come to me. Well, if God really came to you, you'll be dead. So think about what you're asking. Are you asking for your death? So it's better God send an angel that you live and not that you die. So, this is my point. Better to hear God's voice than to see His glory and, and be, you know, become a, a little ash on the ground. So, this is, this is the situation. So the scriptures, you know, these scriptures from the New Testament cannot be twisted and turned into something and made out of something that the Torah never speaks about. That's the problem that we are dealing with here. Then we go on to another one, and I guess the other one was, well, actually, you know, he, he just gave me those. And he gave me another one, yes, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Uh, he said that in 1 Corinthians 10, 2, regarding baptism and the sea, you know, Israel crossing through the sea, 
The question was, it says, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. He, said, he asked me, he said, Do I need to be baptized in the name in water? And is the crossing of Israel to the sea a, a foreshadow of bapt- baptism? And I said, No, neither of the two is true. Another surprise, isn't it? I said, it's not a baptism, and no, you do not have to be baptized in, in, in Jesus' name. Why? Because it's again talking about baptism in the name is a not a water type of thing. It's actually a, another type of thing, living water type of thing. In other words, something that we can't see. Spiritual kind of thing. So I explained to him that there were several baptisms that we did to do with holy festivals of God. We did several baptisms. But this particular baptism that says repentance of sins is not the type of baptism that the church today professes to follow. It is not that. So it's not done the way that you are being presented. So in other words, again, I asked him one simple question. I said, does the Torah tell me to baptize in the name of Jesus? Of course, there were crickets in the room. There is no such commandment. So what do you think the answer is to that one? The answer is no. Because... The name given to God in the Torah is yud heh You may pronounce it Yehovah, you may pronounce it Yahovi, you may pronounce it Yahavah, or you may pronounce it as Yahweh. It's up to you, which way you want to pronounce it. God doesn't care about your pronunciation either. So, having said that, we pronounce it three different ways in the temple. So, again, we always have to go to de facto standard. Like, let me say, let me say one thing. If you bought your, your Ford... Let's say you bought Chevy. You know, Chevy is your car. You like Chevy as a car, you bought it. Something goes wrong with the Chevy. Do you now go to Ford and ask them, what shall I do with this car? It's having this problem. And the Ford guy will probably say, well, I think it's this, and I think it's that, and I think it's the third. Or, do you go back to the D Ford maker, Chevy, and say, Chevy, I have this problem. What can I do to it? And say, oh, screw, you know, tighten this nut and loosen this one and it will be fixed. You see, you always go back to the default maker. So the default maker for Chevy is going to be the, you know, Chevrolet garage, the Chevrolet people. But for God and God's word, what is the default? The first five books of Moses. That is the default for God. God doesn't tell me something in New Testament, brand new, and then says to me, adhere to that. And yet in the Torah, he tells me something completely different. Can anybody tell me in the New Testament, is there, is there a complete reference, I'm not talking about a partial reference, a complete reference to the way a woman should behave after she gives birth? Is there any reference in the, in the New Testament, a complete reference? No, thank you. There will not be any complete, but there is partial references. Where it says that Yeshua, when he was born, his mother and father who were right ruling, righteous, they took him to the, you know, to the priesthood. So there are partial references, not complete references. If you just read those references, you will not understand what to do. You know, what the heck is this going on? You know, why did they take him to the temple? I don't know. For that you have to go to uh, to the book of the Torah. So my point again, that we do not pick up a picture or a reference or a verse in the New Testament and run with it. Oh, must be a hell. Oh, people are going to be punished. Oh, I got to do this. No, you have to go through the five books and see if there is a defining reference and explanation what you have to do. If there is, then yes, the two correlate. If there isn't, then the two do not correlate and the, the, the second one is to be disregarded. That is how we deal with it. So any commandment or any extra things, uh, maybe outside of the commandment actually, any extra thing in the New Testament that has no corresponding reference in the Torah is to be disregarded. That's how it's supposed to be taken. That's very, very simple. It's not hard. It's not rocket science. It's extremely simple. And if you don't know the Torah, then no problem. You know, you can ask me, you can ask Rabbi Kifa, and we can assist you with that and help you to understand what it is that you're supposed to do and not supposed to do. I think it's very simple. Now, coming back to, I guess, Animals. Uh, there's a question about animals. I think this is an interesting one. I uh, was speaking with somebody the other day. It is about animals. Why did God prohibit us from eating animals that are deemed ritually impure 
in the Bible, in the Torah. Now, I'll give you an example. For example, if you ate pork, now pork is deemed ritually unclean. It is a creature that God created. It's a creature that many people love to eat today. Chinese love it. Uh, I guess, you know, some Americans love it. I guess British love it. Many people love eating pork. Okay, fair enough. So, those people, they eat it and they do not die. They don't die, in, they don't fall dead. They eat it and some of them live to be 80 years old. Some of them 90 years old. Maybe somebody even longer. So, my point is, then why did God say, don't eat it? So, if these people can live to be 80 years old, 90 years old, why was God's commandment not to eat these animals? Can anybody partake a guess in that? I think this is one to think about, isn't it? This is one that you'll have to think about and then guess on it. And any guess is good. Okay, Atara is saying that it brings your spirit down. Uh, when Kuni is saying there are another role, they are another role. Okay. Anybody else? Now, you will not hear... What I'm going to teach you today, uh, and, and Jacob is saying that they will lower your vibration. And when Kuni is saying in nature, uh, Abraham is saying they are used to clean the earth. And uh, Adidas saying give you negative energy. Okay. All, all good answers. You miss here, they are really unclean. They are all good answers. Okay. <laughs> now, I guess you miss here just just an observation, you know, not criticizing your answer. But if you go to Costco and you look at pork, it looks rel relatively okay meat to me, well, to the eye, to the naked eye. It looks okay. It can be consumed. So it's not really, really unclean as such. Ritually, yes, but otherwise it's actually looking okay. It's looking shiny meat. But why don't we eat it? Bacteria? Yes, there's bacteria there, of course, but then you know, a lot of people love eating it. And they don't care about bacteria because they think that their bodies can take care of it. So, uh, so my point is that uh, Simha saying they're cleaners for the earth, but that's not the. You see, all of your answers are good answers, but that is not why that God said don't do it. That is not the reason why for it. It's not because they're richly unclean. It's not because they are uh, cleaners of the earth. None of those reasons are valid reasons for us prohibited from those animals. So what I'm going to tell you today, uh, when Kuni is saying that they block, they do block your communication with God. Okay, when Kuni, to down for that. Thank you. So, uh, Lion Prince is saying he was separating the people himself. Okay, that's fair enough. But again, that's not the reason. That is not the reason for us not consuming it. The, the reason I'm going to give you today has been, you probably not hear that reason from any rabbi on this earth. Probably I'm the only one who's going to give you this reason today. Let me, let me tell you the reason why. The reason why God prohibited us from eating a crow, a eagle, a you know an animal like pork, uh, maybe snake, uh, maybe there's others like camel, and so on and so forth. It's actually a very remarkable reason, very remarkable reason, and it's something that people never think about. They are complex creatures, including shrimp. They are complex creatures. You understand what complex means? You know, when, when a woman says, I, I learned this in the Western world. When a woman is, is single and she goes and dates a man and she says, I'm, comp you know, and he, the man asks her, you know, how's your situation? And, and, you know, how's things in your life? And she'll say, it's complicated. <laughs> so I learned, I learned complicated means she's going through a divorce or a breakup or something. And she says, it's complicated. So the reasons for this animal is very complicated. It's complex. Do you understand what I mean? It's complex. Why is it complex? Because just as a woman says to a man in the Western world, honey, it's complicated. I can't explain everything. It is exactly the same thing. The two don't marry. We as human beings cannot marry the, the animal. We cannot adapt their psychology. The animal has a psychology. The animal has a persona. The animal has a character. And we cannot, we cannot absorb all of that. That's why we cannot eat it. That's the only reason, by the way. It's not to do with blood. Uh, it's not to do with uh, uh, being unclean, richly impure, blah, blah, blah. No, none of those reasons are, are necessary to even qualify. Only one reason, complex. The creatures are complex. We cannot 
uh, simulate them into our system because remember what you eat must assimilate into our system into our digestive tracts we cannot do it that's the only reason we can get messed up we can get all sorts of problems psychologically and that's what exactly Rabbi Kifa you are what you eat but you want to become a pig when you eat a pig you become a pig now you're trying to become a pig so you're trying to take the character of the pig and you're trying to assimilate it inside your body it cannot be done we cannot do it Hence why God said, don't eat it. That's the only reason, by the way. There's no other reason. And so, <laughs> I laughed, you know, I was thinking about that one. It like, came like a revelation to me. Pigs, right? And Eddie is saying that pigs are crazy. They, 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 they have crazy lives. And camels, they're always spitting. Exactly. Now, I mean, you imagine, you eat a camel, and camel's character, makeup, complexity, can you absorb? Can you absorb that into your spirit, into your system? The answer is no, you cannot. Same with the pig. It's not going to kill you, by the way. And so when God said, remove the blood from an animal, what do you think was the purpose of removing the blood? Because the blood carries emotions of the animal. So God said, remove the, emo remove the emotions from the ritual clean animals, like sheep, lamb, cow, etc. Remove their emotions. But, even if you remove the blood of a, of a ritually unclean animal like pork or, or, or crab or, you know, or, or some other complex animal like an eagle, the point was that we could not, uh, it, it, we could not, you know, we couldn't take it inside us and then mix with it. That was the problem. Hence why God said, do not eat it. Because you cannot become an eagle. You cannot become, you know, if you eat a snake, you cannot absorb its character. And become like a snake slithering all over the place, like a crazy pig or like a crazy camel. So, this is my point. God is very wise. Infinite wisdom is with God, infinite intelligence. But God tells, God doesn't explain everything to us, but God just tells us, don't do it. Why? Now I'm explaining to you why. Can you really take a, a poor, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the pig per se. Pig is God's created creature. God created him, beautiful creature. Although I don't like his, his, his little snout, but he's a beautiful creature. And uh, some people love it, some children love it, that's fair enough. But my point is this, that it cannot, we cannot, it's a complex creature. We cannot take it inside us and allow our energy, you know, our internal system, our emotions to mix with it. It just will not work. It will cause us all sorts of anxieties and problems beside disease. Beside those diseases, psychologically will end up in all sorts of problems. Psychologically, by the way. So that's the answer there. Interesting answer. You probably find that very interesting because that's really what the answer is. And no rabbi ever talks about this. I don't even think they even realize that's the case. Because we are a different type of creature. We are a different type of creature. They are different from us. They are complex. They have complex systems. They have complex emotions. How is my emotions going to mix in with a, a, a emotion of an animal that I'm not permitted? Maybe like an eagle. Maybe like a snake. Maybe, you know, a white tiger or, you know, some other uh, gigantic animal like a whale. That's the problem we have to deal with. Hence why the need to stay away is not a... a a need because of oh because you're unclean because of X Y Z no is because of the complex you know, complexity of this animal hence why we we are to stay away from it and so we we move on and we look at uh, I wanted to look at uh, uh, you know other dealings of our day to day for instance for instance you know I deal with people who come to me say that Rabbi you know, I'm doing everything that you tell me but nothing's happening or maybe things are not shifting. And what happens is that people go to listen to videos from other Law of Attraction teachers, and the Law of Attraction teachers will be saying things like, hey, your vibration is low, you got to do this to bring your vibration up. Or they'll say, hey, you're not in alignment, and your alignment is out of whack, and you got to do this, and you got to buy my course to bring yourself into alignment, or something to that effect, or, or something else. You know, you find that all over the place. Different teachers have different theologies, 
different you know principles different actions for people based on their understanding of what they call the law of attraction well let me tell you one thing uh, very honestly and straightforward all of that is mumbo jumbo by the way there's no such thing as uh, your vibration is low you cannot achieve it there's no such thing because your vibration you always have a vibration forget about low or high you always have a vibration as any living being any living human being has a vibration and there's no instrument to measure vibration by the way there isn't any so when they say to you oh your vibration is low that's total b sorry to say bs so that's bs number 2 it's bs to say that hey you got to align yourself no you don't need to align yourself with anybody the problem is going to be 9 10 out of 10 with you how you're doing things i spoken to people one to one on phone and i found that their affirmations were wrong they were using the wrong affirmations well what you put in is what you get out you only create what you're asking if you're creating to ask the middle then you're going to create a middle you're not going to create create the end so you have to look at it from the end now if you said if you said that you wanted to get married and you were looking at a screen a movie screen and you saw yourself being married on a movie screen and that was your visualization technique and you said you know i see myself i'm i'm being married on a movie screen with my wife to be and you know she's putting a ring on my finger and i'm putting a ring on on her and we're having a beautiful kiss together well guess what that's what just, that's what just came to pass but you didn't get married the woman didn't turn up in your life you know why because she's over there on the screen you're not even present in that screen because you're looking at a, you're looking at what what i call describe as a third person or a second person you you have to be in the screen you have to be in the first person are you in the first person the answer is no not in a screen screen is like a movie screen you're watching a, a second person you know as you know if let's say uh let's say eddie was doing this to find a wife then eddie will be in the screen with his wife and then what will happen in that screen eddie got married in real life eddie never got married because he is not in the picture himself he is not in the first person so you have to come into the first person how do you come into the first person you may ask and the way you come into the first person is you're not in a screen your visualization doesn't bring the screen up like most of these people tell you what your visualization brings up is you standing in the you know in in your real life and you close your eyes and you see yourself standing there with your wife and you having a third a friend or a relative congratulating you congratulations ready on this beautiful marriage uh, and here is a gift for this marriage that's you in the first person and you're thanking your friend and saying thank you very much for attending my marriage i'm very happy to see you here or you are you know uh, rabbi kifa you in the hospital and your wife is giving birth and you are there you know saying you know all worried and my wife is about to give birth to a child and i just got married a years ago that is a first person principle by the way and so you because you're seeing the end you're not seeing the you're not seeing a movie screen so movie screen idea 9 times out of 10 it doesn't work only 1 times out of 10 it works as a hit and miss by the way So what's the other way people fail? Well, I can tell you that people have listened to my broadcast for the last I don't know umpteen years and some some people listen for you know maybe five times or 10 times each broadcast they still write the wrong affirmations. And when I ask people, "Can you read me your can you read me your affirmation?" and they'll read me their affirmation and I'll say this is incorrect. It's not going to work. So I say to people, "Come to me." and ask me or send me your affirmation or what is it that you're trying to get so I can fix it for you you can have the correct affirmation to do because the difference between getting what you want and not is a wrong affirmation let me give you an example let me give you a broad example a very you know kind of illustrated example uh let's say that you are trying to um manufacture a car for yourself let's say you want a car and you say to yourself uh, to the effect of you write an affirmation and you say that you might say i will have a car by such and such date now will that work answer is yes but will it work quickly answer is no it will be take a long time for it to work 
In fact, your date will come and pass. You wouldn't have the car. And then you have to rejig your date to another date. So, you know, you may put down a date for three months. You will not be able to buy that car in three months because you, you set your affirmation wrong. But you still get the car, but it may, two, may take two, three, five years maybe it takes to get that car. And you'll be wondering, what, what is going on with this? I've written this affirmation, and I'm saying that I'm going to have a car. Why haven't I got a car yet? Because your affirmation is wrong. That's why. Okay, there's another, another way. You might say that, you know, I'm going to get a job. could be for a job. You say, I'm going to have a job. Such and such place, at such and such time, at such and such date. When you start putting dates on, by the way, there is a particular way to write a date and there is a particular way not to write a date and I can guarantee that majority of you will write the dates wrong. Because if you say that I am going to have a car, I am going to have a car, uh, no, a job, I am going to have a job by, by, let's just pick a date, October 15. I am going to have a job October 15. That affirmation will not work, by the way. October 15 will come and go and you will still be wondering where is my job. It will not come. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Ed is asking that should we still use the days method. Rabbi, should we still use the days method in addition to the now method? I am a millionaire now. I have two million dollars in 365 days. Okay, so let me actually give you a correct one, Eddie, for that. And you can write it down as I speak it. You will say the words. You don't need to say a word now, by the way. That's another, mis that's another one that you definitely don't need to have in your affirmations to make it work. Let me give you a very simple, simple, simple idea. And there is a dog, right, that's been barking around my and on the side of, you know, there's a, there's a house right next to us. And there's a dog that barks that there or was barking all day long and all, all night strong. You know, he would bark, 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 yap, 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 all night. And uh, wouldn't let anybody sleep. So I listened to him, you know, one day, two day, three day, and uh, I waited for it. I waited for it. Maybe they'll do something about him. They didn't. So one day, I decided to do something myself about this creature. I thought I'm going to do something lovable about this creature. Something you know, lovely that put him to complete rest. So I can sleep at night in you know, complete peace. So I could have said, you know, I could have said something to the effect of, the dog has now stopped barking. The dog has now stopped barking. Right? That would never work, by the way. You get, it? You get me now what I mean by the now? Again, do not believe every statement you read in books. But there is a way to write something to make it work. I wrote a very simple statement about the dog. A very simple statement. In two days, the dog completely stopped barking. And even the daytime, you don't hear him barking now. And I work on that. I'm still working on it. And the dog is so quiet in the daytime. Because if you had listened, if I was talking now, we'd have to shut all the windows so the dog's bark noise doesn't come into the room. Now the windows are open and you don't hear nothing. That's how beautiful the affirmation works for me. Because I know exactly how to word it. When you word things wrong, you will not get the results quickly. So, I'm a millionaire now. No, Eddie, that is not accurate. Remove the word now in there, altogether. Cross it out. You don't need it. This is what you're going to say. You are just going to put the word... There's two ways to write this. I am a millionaire, full stop. That's it. And after that, you can put something else, which will help you further reinforce it. There's three, there's three ways to reinforce that. Number one, I... Comma, Eddie, am a millionaire. My goodness, that is one heck of powerful affirmation. It is much more powerful than just saying I am. When you say I, Eddie, am a millionaire. No nows, no thens, no ifs, no buts. Remove all of those other things. They're extraneous. They're not needed. So you're going to say I, Eddie, I, comma, Eddie, am a millionaire. The infinite intelligence. Now listen to the next bit. The infinite intelligence works beautifully inside me to make this happen. Now let me say it again slowly. I, Eddie, I, comma, Eddie, am a millionaire. Full stop. The infinite intelligence within me makes this 
beautifully happen. I hope you got that, Eddie. I hope you wrote, wrote that down. So those two little bits will add so much power to your affirmation that you will start seeing shifting happen in your life. So I know people read, uh, you know, Tol Eckhart's book and they think that's it, you know, we have to do now everything. Now, no, you don't. I have, I have read, uh, I haven't read all of his book, but I've heard part of his book on audio and I disagree with the fact that you have to do now for everything. No, you don't. Definitely not. Because my affirmations, majority of my affirmations don't even have the word now in there. And they are coming to pass like this. You know, on clicks. Why? Because this is all a fad. You know, you can, everybody has their own method. And yes, it might work for some people, but it's not necessary. Your mind, your subconscious is connected with God. The I am is connected. Let me give you a statement today to prove my thesis. I'm going to go read from Psalm 5. Psalm 5 says as follows. But as for me, verse 7, But as for me, I will come into your house. In the multitude of your loving kindness, in your fear, I will pay homage towards your holy temple. That's one verse, by the way. I'll come back to that in a second. Next verse. Next verse. But let all those that put their trust in you rejoice. Let them shout for joy. Because you defend them, let them also that love your name be joyful in you. Okay, I'm going to ask you the question now. What does it mean, love your name? Can anybody interject here and give me a suggestion? What does it mean that love your name? Now I will tell you that majority of the ignorant people out there who go by different titles, they will say name means you have to say Yahweh or you have to say Yahovah or you have to say you know Yahovah or something. It's absolutely nothing to do with that. So, what does it mean to love His name? Because it says, let me let me read that statement again. Let me read the statement again for you. Uh, and you may see us saying that the I am loves us. Of course, God loves us. There's no no deniability about that. But let me read the statement again. It says, it says. Uh, in verse 11 of Psalm 5. But let all those that put their trust in you rejoice. Let them shout for joy because you defend them. Let them also that love your name be joyful in you. Let them also that love your name. Okay. Now let me see the first statement. It says, But as for me, but as for me, I will come into your house. This statement is very similar to what Joshua said, that me and my house. I used to have a verse of the Bible hooked up on my wall in England. And it was this verse from the book of Joshua. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Do you remember that verse from the book of Joshua? I had that in my home in, back in England. Big, it was a big one. <laughs> I bought it from a Christian, Christian church. Or I think it was a Christian shop. I got it from a Christian shop. I really liked that verse. I put it up in my, you know, my, just inside my front door. And for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I love that verse. So, what does it actually mean, serve the Lord? So, so again, what does it mean to, to you know, uh, and, and love His name? So, these are the things that we need to understand. And this is where the priesthood comes in, by the way. So, where, why, do, why does a priesthood, why does a priesthood exist? You know, why? Why does a priesthood exist? The, the reason why the priesthood exists is because the Bible is a very complex book. It's a spiritual book. It's not a history book, although it does tell history. It's not a scientific book, although it does talk, talk about science. But it has, it has spirituality and it has, you know, hidden secrets within it. You know, in the, behind the, 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 the Hebrew and the annoyances of the Bible, there's hidden things. But having said that, there are some open things. 
but people cannot make sense of it because it is a complex book. Just as we are complex, you know, human beings, you know, no doctor has been able to make sense of human beings so far, what we are. Same as the Bible is very complex. So therefore, God has given the priesthood certain knowledge and understanding that they can interpret that, you know, that complexity in the Bible. That's why God has a priesthood. This is why everybody can't just run around and say, oh, yeah, I don't need anybody, I can do it by myself. That's why people come up with all sorts of bad interpretations and wrong information. So, when it says, when it says, uh, like, but let all those that put their trust in you rejoice. Let them shout for joy. Of course, over here, all he's talking about is that you're giving God glory and you're giving Him, he's basically talking about gratitude to God. But then it goes on and says something fundamental. It says, because you defend them. Okay, we'll stop at that part. Then it goes, let them also that love your name be joyful in you. What that means actually is, is <laughs> it doesn't actually tell you there. What it actually means is remarkable if you think about it. God said in the book of Exodus chapter 3 verse 14, I am that I am. You know, that's how the Bible's, most Bibles translated is the actual you know close Hebrew and it says I am that I am or I will be that I will be or I was that I was etc all three combined together so I am that I am so what here is saying Eddie and the rest is that when you say I am you're glorifying the name do you understand? That's what he's saying. He's saying, ask it with I am, and you'll receive it. So when you say, I am, I Eddie am, a millionaire, what are you doing? You're glorifying the name of God. You're asking in God's name. That's what it means. It doesn't mean to how to pronounce the name, and how to, you know, stick the characters, and how to put the vowel points. The rest of the world, and the so-called rabbis out there, and non-rabbis, they're all running around with, oh, call it this way and call it that way. No, it's none of that. It's actually talking about you naming God. you using the, the very term that God gave to Moses, I am. That's the term that God gave Moses. In the basic, basic form. When you use the term, I am, you're glorifying God's name in your life. Whenever you say, I am, you're glorifying Him. You can glorify Him negatively, or positively. How do you glorify him negatively? You might say, I am sick. Guess what you just did? You made yourself sick by using God's name. You might say, I am healthy. Guess what you just did? You made yourself healthy by using God's name. The God's name has power to do both. If you tell yourself you are sick by using the I am terminology, you will become sick. If you tell yourself you are healthy, you will become healthy. That is a 100% guaranteed. Guaranteed or guaranteed it will happen. And people have done that. People will say, I'm sick of this. And guess what happens to them? They remain sick of that. They use terminology in their daily language and they don't know what they are doing with it. They are infusing it with God's name and power. And they will become that person. Or they, may, or they may say to the effect of, uh, you know, I hate this. And again, these kind of phrases are very powerful and they are very negative. And they have a negative connotation on your health and your body. So absolutely, Rabbi, your words have also power. So now let's look at the other, other verse I gave you. The other verse I gave you was, uh, it says, it says, but as for me, I will come into your house. Where is the house of God, by the way? Well, none of us can go to Jerusalem because there is no house there. So where is the house of God? In our subconscious mind, by the way. That's where God's house is. Because we make a connection from here to the heavens above. That's where the house is. So King David saying, I come into your house. Because the house is where the Spirit of God dwells. Where the kingdom is, where the Master Yeshua said, the kingdom is within you. Well, where is it within me? Is it in my lungs, in my liver, in my stomach, in my abdomen? Where is it? It's in my head. 
is where we call what we call the subconscious. That's what makes the connection. The subconscious, by the way, is a spiritual thing. It never dies. You may die as a person, but your subconscious power, the connectivity activity to God, will never die. You will never die as a person, by the way. Your soul will always live. And so that's important. Now the other bit that I just said, he said this, Lead me, O Yahweh, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Where is, what, what does righteousness here mean? Remember I told you, righteousness is hitting the mark. Lead me, O Yahweh, in your righteousness. Where? God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be fulfilled. God wants you to have abundance. Where is all that going to come from? From within. Not without. Because you're going to seek it within and God's going to give it to you. Yes, when you sleep, I am is there. And when you wake, I am is there as well. Both times. So again, it's talking about your within. And not without. And it says here in verse 3. See, I love this Psalms. And it says, My voice you will hear in the morning. O Yahweh, in the morning will I direct my prayers to you and look up. Where exactly is going to look up? He's looking to himself. To his subconscious where he's connecting to God. Uh, welcome to you, Yan 2019. So, here, King David is talking about looking to himself within. He understood that concept. In the morning, I will look up. So, he will look up. Lead me, O Yahweh, in your righteousness because of my enemies. And he says, in the morning, in the morning, remember I told you, he says, my voice you will hear in the morning. In other words, God is very perceptive. God's spirit. God's Spirit is very perceptive in the morning, first thing. So, this is why I was saying to the people, the families, the awesome tribes of Israel, that when you wake up in the morning, that's a beautiful time to reach out to God. Because God is very perceptive in the morning to listen to you. So, it's a good idea that if you are not working nights, that you do this in the morning. The I am phrase in the Hebrew is Ehiye, Asher, Ehiye. So hence why it is important to, to and I'm not saying that it's, it's a bad idea to do it in the evening. Of course, if you work in the, in the night shift and you get up, you know, you get up in the morning at 6, 7 o'clock, then of course you can do it, you know, you can do it at night time. Your affirmations are very important. Look, you know, before you go to bed, you should be saying the affirmation. I am healthy. I am wealthy and whatever else you want to say after that. I am healthy, I am wealthy, I am riches. I am healthy, I am wealthy, I am riches. You should be saying that before you sleep. Why? Because it impregnates your mind before you sleep. And you give thanks to God. As I spoke about this in the past, give thanks to God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Master of Heaven and Earth. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You give thanks and you apologize for anything you've done wrong. I'm sorry, please forgive me if I've done anything wrong today, if I've made any offense, please forgive me. And, and if, if somebody else has made offense against me, I forgive them. Uh, yes, Rabbi Kifa, correct. I'm abundance, I'm complete, I'm whole. These are good affirmations to have. So when you say, you say I am healthy, I am wealthy, I am riches, you're actually, you're actually planting success into your, into your personal self. Uh, well, when you're, when you're lying down, Olivia, when you're at night, you lie in your bed, you don't have to worry about success direction. You can just lie down and say that before you sleep. I am healthy, I am wealthy, I am rich. You say it a few times. Don't just say it once. You know, say it about 10, 15 times. I am healthy, I am wealthy, I am riches. I am healthy, I am wealthy, I am riches. I am healthy, I am wealthy, I am riches. Boom, 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 boom. Few times. You know, so you then you give thanks to God. Clap. I give thanks, I give thanks. Bruch Hashem Yahweh. You know, I do that all the time. So you give thanks to God and you do good for yourself. And then you sleep with peace. You don't sleep with, you know, all anxiety and what's going to happen tomorrow and am I going to go to heaven or hell? Am I going to be raptured or not? You know, there's Christian uh, beliefs that, that are out there. So you don't need to carry any of those. It's very simple. It's all there. It's not hard. But you have to, you know, you have to really get an understanding of how the Spirit of God works. 
This is not dogma, by the way. This is not like some dogmatic statement. You know, every person may find that a little tweak in an area will give them better benefit. I asked this question, by the way, to the heavens. That, that's why I told you today. I asked a question to the heavens. I said, what is better? Is it better for me to say I am rich or I am a millionaire? Or is it better for me to say I, Simon, am a millionaire? Which is better out of the two? I asked this question twice to the heavens this week. And you know, both times I got the answer. Say with the name. I, Simon, am a millionaire. I, comma, Simon, am a millionaire. Then I asked, then I asked, what about I am? No. I said, I am is good, but I, Simon, is better. So I got the answer both times the same. Say with your name. Why? Because your name is a character unto yourself. Now you're joining your name's character onto God's character. You're joining it. And it's much more powerful. So this idea that you have to say now, no. I don't, I don't use that in many of my affirmations. And all my affirmations are coming to pass, by the way. Every affirmation I'm writing to date. And as I told you, that my top, top affirmation is family, relationships. I have mended every relationship in my family so far. Every relationship that I had that was bad, I mended it by using these kind of methods. And so I encourage you to do the same. Because you can. Because everything hangs around the family. Whether it's a brother, sister, wife, husband, father, mother, you know, cousin, whatever. Everything hangs around the family. So, you know, to some people, maybe their job is more important. So they write an affirmation to do with job. Some people, maybe it's more important to get a million dollars in the bank right now. Meaning that it's not going to happen right now. It doesn't matter how many times you say, now, 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 now. It's not going to happen now. It's only going to happen at a set time. So you don't have to keep saying, now, now, now. You don't have to say that. The set time is set time. You cannot change it. But you can bring it forward by the way you say it. When you say, Eddie, I, Eddie, am a millionaire. Guess what? You already speeded yourself up two times. Then by just saying, I am a millionaire. That's the difference. Oh, there's another third, there's a second method, which I love as well. You say to yourself, this, whatever your full name is, and however you pronounce it, I'm not sure of how you pronounce your surname. Is it Serviano or something like that? Maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong. So, let's say I'll speak about myself. I might say Simon Altaf is my name, okay? So, you, this is what I do. I am Simon Altaf. Okay, I say that to myself. I am Simon Altaf. And then I'll repeat my affirmation. That even works terrific. That's terrific. You say, I am Simon Altaf. I am wealthy. Now, doubled up. See how that works for you? Because I'm giving my, my statement to my mind, which is a true statement. It's not a false statement. It's not a made up. Because your name is what your name is. So when you say, I am Eddie, then there is a true statement. Then you add on the next affirmation. I am Eddie. I'm a, you know, I'm a millionaire. Boom. It takes it in. Accepts it. But when you say, I am a millionaire, and you say it a million times, and nothing seems to happen, you know why sometimes things don't happen? Well, I was listening to Dr. Dr. Murphy. And I found something interesting with Dr. Joseph Murphy, and also the other man was Neville. The two were the only two students that were famous. The only two students that were famous were Rabbi Abraham Abdullah. You know, Abdullah was their, uh, Rabbi Abdullah was their teacher. And these are the two students he produced. And they, by the way, they were both British. Surprise, surprise. They're both British in the past. Of course, they, they both passed on. But they were both British. And I found that very interesting that they came to America to learn from a rabbi, yet they were both British. Isn't that surprising? And where did Rabbi Simon come from? England. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think God has a funny sense of humor. So, my point is this, that uh, what's his name? Uh, Dr. Murphy was speaking about some experiences of some people, and they came to him and said, we are repeating the affirmation night after night. You know, like something to the... I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I'm a millionaire, but nothing is happening. 
He told them, is because you do not believe in it. That's why. Because you already don't believe the statement. You're saying it, but you don't believe it. Secondly, as soon as you say the statement, five minutes later, you're telling yourself that I'm not a millionaire. Why am I, you know, I'm saying this, but I'm not a millionaire. So it's no, never going to come to pass. He said you can say it a million times, it's never going to come to pass. It's because of your psychology. So you explain to them that your psychology is causing the failure. So then, then he gave them an alternative, what to do in that particular instance. And there are people like that, by the way. There are people like that, that do that. They say the statement, but at the same time, their negativity tells them that, hey, you got no money in the bank. What do you mean you're a millionaire? So they, have a pro so they do not get anywhere. So the way to come around it is to say, I am Eddie. Now that's a true statement. The subconscious will not reject your true statement. Then same time you say, I am Eddie, I'm a millionaire, boom, sinks in. The gate is open, you go right in. Or you say, I, Eddie, am a millionaire, boom, sinks in. The subconscious cannot refuse it. The conscious mind has to accept it and pass it through. Because that's the, by the way, that's the filter. So it goes right into the right place and it takes effect. That's why it's very important to understand what I'm telling you. is a, This information I'm giving you today is a billion dollar information. None of these teachers out there are telling you that even. Because they're giving you this nonsense about, oh, your vibration is so low, oh, you're uh, not aligned with the universe. That's all mumbo-jumbo BS. It's not true. You can, you can live a complete negative life. And if you follow the method I give you, you'll get what you want. I won't guarantee the money will stay. Because the money might leave straight, as fast as it comes, as fast as it goes. But you will get it. As it has happened to many people in this world who received big jack force only to lose it. The, the reason was that they hadn't dealt with their internal self. They hadn't dealt with their negative attitudes about money. They hadn't dealt with how they thought about other people who had money. Because let me tell you what happens. Let me tell you what happens. You see Bill Gates. And I see, I hear a lot of people out there who got these conspiracy theories about Bill Gates. Oh, Bill Gates is no good because he's trying to, you know, cut down the population. And he's an evil man and he's a rich man. He's a, he's a very bad man. He's this, is that and the third. See, people have these kind of theologies and dogmatic statements. But Bill Gates is a rich man. So you, ju so you judge Bill Gates and you judge him as criminal. In your opinion, he is a rich man and he is a criminal, in your opinion. Okay? So what happens, what have you just done? You want to be rich yourself, just like Bill Gates, but you already judge Bill Gates as a criminal. So what do you think money will do to you? Money will leave you faster than an eagle. Money will fly away from you. Because you already judge the rich man as evil. You said, he is evil, his money is evil. And then you go back to your biblical statement, which by the way is not Bible statement. The love of money is the root of all evil. The problem is this, that you believe more in Paul than you believe in Moses. That's your problem, majority of you. Because you don't believe in, in Moses, but you believe in Paul. And Paul only makes a statement and you think, oh, Paul is God. Because Paul said it must be true. That's your other problem that you're dealing with. So you need to stop doing that. You need to put the Torah where the Torah is in his rightful place and put Paul in his rightful place. Exactly, uh, Eddie, because you know, Jesus Yeshua also came to this rich man and he gave him a statement to sell everything, but was he actually telling him to sell everything? The rich man didn't understand, went away sad. And we can we can look at you know we can look at that statement today. You know, rich man and Jesus and the rich man came to Jesus and said, you know, what should I do? You know, he was asking about the kingdom. You know, Jesus was going about his daily business. And he says to him, he says to me, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what does Jesus respond? He says, why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. But then he answers his question, says, you know the commandments. And he says, you must not murder, you must not commit adultery. Of course, they are paraphrased. Because here he mentioned all the commandments that the New Testament writers omitted deliberately. So then the man replied and said, I've obeyed all the commandments. 
I obeyed all these commandments since I was young. And then, then and Jesus turned around and said to him, There is still one more thing you need to do. He said, What? He said, Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. And at this time, he says, a man's face fell and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Again, this is not talking about literally selling his possessions. Number one, it was a test. Number two, number two, Jesus wasn't saying to the man, hey, become poor, and then you're going to get heaven. See, that's what Christian church teaches you. So the whole commandment, this whole thing is, is an allegory. It's an allegory of a, it's a story basically. It's a story that occurred with Jesus and Jesus is making a point. And the point is simply this. It says don't attach yourself to your wealth. That's the only point is made. It says if you attach yourself to your wealth, you will die the death. Jesus didn't say go sell your wealth. He said don't attach to it. So the selling there was a, a metaphor. Selling metaphor meant don't attach yourself to your wealth. Now let me give you an example. I, I read the testimony, I heard the testimony of this man and I gave this testimony to one of the family, awesome tribes of Israel, to, to listen to. This Indian man had a real good testimony. He said that he was working in Silicon Valley in California. I think his name is... Uh, I'll have to look at his name. Uh, he's got a kind of funny kind of first name. And uh, the man, let me see his first name, I'll probably have, uh, yeah, his name is Ravi Kant. Ravi Kant is his, his surname, Kamal Ravi Kant. And Kamal Ravi Kant said this, he said that I was so attached, I was making this firm, I was making this, you know, I, I got this fund, I got this capital, and I was building this company for myself in Silicon Valley. And he said ego was a big problem, he said I had a lot of ego, and I wanted to make this real big business, build, you know, millionaire business, go to make billions. He said, I was so attached to it, so attached to it, I invested everything I had, my, you know, relatives money and other people's money, and he said, it, the whole thing collapsed on me. He said, I couldn't fathom why it collapsed on me. He said, I came to the floor. And when I came to the floor, to the ground, I realized, I realized to myself, what did I do wrong? What was it that I was doing wrong about this? You know, something's going to be wrong. He said, I realized afterwards, I was attached to it. I was attached to the outcome. I attached too much myself to the outcome and ego and everything was attached to it. He said, had I detached, I would have made that company successful. That was his, his sum total of what he said. He said, that was my problem. So what Jesus was teaching is do not attach yourself to your wealth. Separate yourself. In other words, so use the terminology, sell it. Meaning, separate yourself from it. But doesn't mean you have to physically sell everything and become poor. He wasn't saying that. You know, a rich man, a rich man, I was reading about uh, one of these billionaires. One of these billionaires uh, gave Mr. Trump, the president, during his presidency uh, in 2016, somewhere around there, he gave him, uh, I think it was uh, $25 million. And to him, he's a billionaire. It's loose change. He didn't become poor, did he? But he detached himself from his wealth. So what he did, he detached himself, he said, you know what, I'm going to give Mr. Trump the new president, he supports the Republican Party. He gave him 25 or whatever odd million dollars. Did he become poor? No. Did he detach himself? Absolutely yes. Will he be blessed? 100% he'll be blessed by it. That's what Jesus was teaching. Jesus was teaching to detach from the wealth and allow things to take shape. But what the Christian church made out of it is a pity poultry, you know, doctrines and statements that, you know, that, that make people poor and bring them to destitution and desperation. He wasn't speaking about that, by the way. He never said become desperate and destitute because Jesus himself was from a very rich family. So why would a person from a very rich family tell you to become destitute? His father-in-law was one of the richest, you know, one of the richest men in Jerusalem. Is the richest, you know, is the person with the rich, uh, sorry, not his father-in-law, his, his grandfather. His grandfather was the richest man in Jerusalem. Would he tell you, a man who has a grandfather who is the richest man in Jerusalem to sell everything and 
you know, scrum, you know, like flounder it and go away and just become poor. That would be absolutely pathetic to even think like that. But that's what the Christian church teaches. I met a man who became a student of mine from Singapore. And he was told to become poor. He took a vow of poverty and destitution. Because he was taught by his pastors that you have to be poor to be pious. And you don't have to marry. You don't marry and you remain poor and you remain unmarried. And you go, you'll be right in God's eyes. When that person came to me, I told him that you are living in sin, in violation of Torah. This is not what the Torah commands. I then helped him to break his vow. He was so bitter at that point that he had been led astray by these pastors in Singapore. And yet these pastors, some of these pastors over there were driving Bentleys, Mercedes, Bentleys, expensive cars. And they were telling their congregation that you have to be pious to be is poor, you know, is pious to be poor, or poor to be pious. And so this is my point: people are being deceived, and you know, deceived by church theologies that have no basis behind anything. So with that, you know, I'm going to tell you, you know, I'm giving you a little bit of what you need to think about is. Remember, you have a coin in your gate. It's purpose for the coin in the gate. Don't shirk from your responsibilities, number one. Number two, compliance. The festivals are coming up. They are our festivals, all seven of them. We are going to have the fall feast soon, starting from, uh, if you follow the, the Hanuk calendar, then of course, I believe the first one's going to fall on November, sorry, not November, September, the, I believe it's the uh, 19, the first feast of trumpets, according to the Hanuk calendar. And the lunar calendar, the Rosh Hashanah, falls on September 30th. So, depending on which calendar you follow, you're going to be hitting at least one or two festivals this month, and you're going to be hitting uh, another uh, couple of festivals next month. So, there's a lot of festivals coming up. And you need to consider where you are with everything be, be, between you and God. Where are you with that? And what you need to do about it. So, uh, you know, be in compliance with the Torah. And remember that it's not just about saying an affirmation. It's to say it correctly. Uh, yes, we can blow the trumpet on all the festivals. All the festivals you can blow the trumpet. So, you know, I would only like to say this, that, you know, I'm here, I would most likely, and I have absolutely no problem helping people who need help. And I do, you know, I'm always speaking with somebody on the phone who needs help. But my point is, is that please be mindful of my role and your role as Israel. Because you are, you have joined the children of Israel. Benai Israel, you joined Israel by choice. You were not forced into it. Some of you are probably bloodline Israelites. Others of you may be people who just joined and become Israel by joining Israel. But so you have taken on the responsibility of the covenant, and God says, "Do not transgress the covenant." And the covenant go back, goes back to Abraham, and then to Moses, and to succession through his sons, in Abraham's sons being Isaac, Jacob, and then there on forward. So with that, you need to really consider, consider prayerfully that are you living a correct life before God, before you enter these festivals? Because God usually blesses His people during the festival times. But then God will look at your character, God will look at what you've been doing all year, and then God will determine the blessings based on that. And if you've been, you know, all over the place and not done the right thing, then of course the results will be likewise. Zero plus zero will always be zero. So remember that. With that, I'll leave you. Love you. Have a great Shabbat and great week ahead. Over to you, uh, Rabbi Kifa. Tudah. Rabbi Kifa coming in from home base in San Antonio, Texas, with Hashem. Uh, Hakoin, quick question, Hakoin, quick question for the Mishpahah and myself. Uh, uh, some clarification. 
when we use the name with the specific way that we do our affirmations, the particular name that we use. Because I know a lot of us have Hebrew names, and, and uh, we have our government names and the name we were born with. Which name is the best name to use? Uh, I think that's a pertinent question that we need to ask ourselves. Because I know a lot of folks have Hebrew names that they have a, they come to adopt opposed to using. You may use the name that you were born with, okay? Just for those that are listening via YouTube as well, make sure you use the name that you're born with. That's going to be very important to really hone in and laser point your affirmations so you can attract your affirmations and the desires and the wants and be able to call it in and uh, manifest those things that you want in your life. How many things, how many of you want to manifest things in your life? You want to manifest, how many of you right now, you say, that's what I want. I, wa I want to manifest things in my life. Well, Hakoyan has truly given us the keys to the kingdom. We have the keys to the kingdom. We just must be able to operate them properly. Now, quick, uh, I want to do some quick administrative things right here. Uh, <laughs> James says, I, James, say thank you. <laughs> <We're just here. laughs> yeah, begin to put that into place. Begin to put, put yourself present. You need to be present. I think that's very, very critical and very, very key. Now, what I've noticed, even from anybody that associates and attaches themselves to our history, to our books, and to uh, the, 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 the spirit of the creator of the heavens and the universes, and this earth, by the way, um, is that, uh, and I know all of you can probably agree with me as well, in your journey and in your experiences, you have gained something from every place that you've been. Can anybody agree with me on that? Maybe you were in Catholicism. I know you, you can take something from Catholicism. Maybe you were a, you were a, you were a non-denominational Christian. You can pull something from Christianity. You understand what I'm saying? And I think that was one of the really, really great points. I mean, that's one of the key things that I like about Joel Osteen. He has like a humble spirit to him. Very humble spirit, very meek spirit. You know, he reminds me of a little sheep. <laughs> I, mean, I see him when I see the sheep. And, you know, he really he really does, he has a, a, a heart of compassion, a heart of love. You know, uh, over here with Hagee, I like him because he's a bit of a character. And he really has a, he has a zeal for Israel. I don't know if you ever listened to Hagee, but he really loves Israel. And he's pro-Israel, and he loves to support Israel. And guess what? I'm Israel. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I really like that as well. So in, in your journey, in your experiences, always look at, don't, don't focus on, oh, God, why did you leave me in that religion so long? How about focus on what did you learn from that? What, what can you pull up? What can you extract from that that can empower you as you continue on the road in your journey? You understand what I'm saying? I think that's very important. Is that we take it, we don't look at the negativity. Don't focus on the negativity. Too many folks out here are uh, focusing on the negativity. We need to be the opposite, the polar opposite side of the stick and look at the positivity in life and be present now. Be present. Be present. That's what's important. You see, you, you need to take yourself away. And that's what I learned from the Now book that I was reading, is that you just need to be present. Make yourself here, now, not in the future, not in the past, but be now. I am is, is right. It, it, it's, it, you're present. You're here. And just like the God of Israel tells us, he's, he, his, his name is presence because he is present. So then you as offshoot, offspring, DNA of El Shaddai, you as well need to be present. A lot of times, yeah, we're present in body, but our mind and spirit are in the past or in the future. Make yourself present right now. Make yourself present. You're present. You're present. I'm here. I'm present. I, Lamont, am a millionaire. You see? So I think that's very important. 
Because what does that statement do? It makes you present. It makes you, you don't have to, it's no by and by, or oh, I'm going to dream about it in my dreams, and one day it's going to happen. No, it's right. You, 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 you're, you're present. You're here. You're here and account for. So administration, things that need to be done, for those of you that want to send in correspondence, the uh, UPS store where we have, uh, have our address box for the uh, for Forever Israel for Abrahamic Faith Bible is uh, they moved their location. Actually, the woman that I've been knowing for years, she retired. Her and her husband, they bought a Winnebago, and they're traveling the country, and they're very happy. And I'm so happy for them and so grateful for them. She's a great woman. She's a great woman, have a great spirit, and she's done a lot of things behind the scenes for 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 you know God's children and I'm so grateful to her and I'm so happy that she's moving on and uh, so what she did was she sold her UPS store to somebody else and what he did was he moved the location so if you want a new location it's going to be posted it probably already is up on our websites and everything already and it's going to go into any new printed publications that do come out but uh, what I did was is that uh, there it is right there that's the new address right there if you want it I texted, but I will also read it out for those of you who are listed via uh, YouTube. But you can also get it from my website as well. So if you want to go to our website, you know, uh, abrahamic-faith.org, I mean, sorry, .info, then you can get it there as well. Or I'll read it out to you. It's Forever Israel or Abrahamic Faith. It's going to be at uh, 8407 Bandera Road, Suite 103-152. San Antonio, Texas, 78250. That's going to be the new address, Mishpaha, for those of you who want to send in correspondence. Uh, that, that's where it's going to be at. Uh, if you need more information, if you didn't get it, you want to get the spelling right, you can go to our website also and get it there at abrahamic-faith.info. And so you can pick it there as well. So that's going to be going forward. They're giving us a little leeway. I think he said a month or two. He's giving us a little leeway to make the transition over to the new experience, the new location where they will be headed uh, going forward. So I think that's very, very important and very, very vital for us to going forward. We can uh, truthfully uh, see where we're heading. We see where we're heading, and we know where we're heading, and we are heading. We're heading, right? Because why? We're present. All of you are present and accountable for today. And I'm so happy and grateful that you are here. Uh, I took some time this morning to go away with the family early this morning, and we watched the sun come up in the park, and we actually took family pictures this morning. Uh, Pharaoh and all, we packed up everybody early this morning, so we got to see the sun come up. I tell you, it's truly beautiful out there in the park, and you're watching the deer go by you, and the deer looking at you, I tell you, you know, I'm truly grateful, and I'm truly thankful to the God of Israel to the Master, Master Yeshua, Master Yahweh, for my dispersion here in San Antonio, Texas, in a great country, this great shepherd nation, North America, uh, to be here and to uh, to have an abundance of a life. I'm, I'm just truly grateful and thankful. Thankful for my Kohen in the gate, as always. Uh, uh, sir, is there time for me to text in a question? Yes, luxury class, you can do that before we start. We, before I start my lecture. So I think it's very, very important for us to understand. Today's uh, uh, discussion is going to be about uh, something that I think is quite pertinent, quite relevant to Hakoni's lecture. As I always seem to piggyback off the Kogin. But we want to talk about the freedom. We talk about the freedom of the Torah, the freedom of uh, the, the laws of Moses all the time. And I think it's important that we understand and we ask ourselves this question. Is freedom really free? Uh, could you please give me a quick overview of the do's and don'ts of uh, on the Shabbat for people to keep? Okay, for that, you probably want to get, and I don't know if you already have it, but the Siddur. You need up the Siddur, that'll have all the do's and don'ts in there already. Uh, and, uh, uh, other than not work, uh, not working labor. Okay, yeah. That, that uh, yeah. Or oh, buying or selling. Okay, well, that again, you can pick it up. You can pick up the... If there's any specific question that you may have, but, you know, the rest of it you can find in the Sador. It's, it's pretty straightforward in the Sador. You get the Sador, it will really it will really help you with that luxury class so you can be in compliance. Because what we want to do is be in compliance. I was in the store the other night, and um, I was actually attracted and uh, attracted an Iranian guy. We were in the store together. I was picking up some fish. He was picking up some fish. 
And, uh, you know, he was telling me about, I mean, Iranian guy. I was so happy to meet him. And full disclosure, this Iranian guy looked just like Akoli. I mean, look, Persian looked just like Akoli. I was like, man. Yeah, and you know, the first thing uh, he said, uh, I, okay, luxury flight saying, I have uh, the general understanding, but want to know a bit more about specifics. Okay, well then, uh, shoot, you, you can send us in an email with specific questions that you may have about a specific subject about the Shabbat, and uh, we can we can answer that. But with the full understanding of this a luxury class, and I, I had to get to this point as well, it's because when I first came into the truth, it was through Judaism. And Judaism put a lot of restrictions on me. And with the Kohen, what the Hakoni did, and I'm pretty sure Judaism put a lot of restrictions on a lot of other people. If I'm not the only one, can somebody put up an R for me for restriction? So what the Kohen did was his explanation and opening up the Torah, the mysteries of the Torah to me and what Shabbat really meant, it really, it really helped me realize that, man, within the confines of the Torah, I'm free. I am totally free. You know what I'm mean? I'm free to go to the park on the Sabbath. I, I can go to the park. Matter of fact, we was there before the sun went up anyway. I can go to the park on the Sabbath and take pictures. I was like, wow, that is truly, truly free. Because I, I tell you, I was sweating bullets on the Shabbat trying to keep up with the restriction. Because how many of you mean? I mean, you I mean, you sweating bullets, you walking on eggshells on the, you know, on the Shabbat. Oh, oh, can I do that? Oh, uh, let me just do it. Oh, I want to make sure I don't get zapped over here. Oh, oh, I do this on the Shabbat. I mean, my goodness. It came to the point that I was just like, I was just like, oh, maybe I'm better off staying in the bed under the mattress in these sheets all day long until the sun goes down because I, told, I just don't want to do anything wrong. You know what I mean? I, I, I just don't want to mess up on the Shabbat. You know, this is our holy day. You know, but again, you'll find luxury class and you'll probably come back and tell me, it's like, well, Rabbi Kiva, you was right. You know, Hakoin a answered my questions and I tell you, there's so much freedoms within the Torah that are not explained and are explained, but are just not explained in, let's say, a, 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 with, the under, with a spiritual understanding at the level of a Kohen. See, this is another great example of why the Kohen is so important. You understand? And you all, I know you all do understand, and you all do appreciate, and you all are grateful for that fact. But I tell you what, I will never leave the Kohen. But back to my story with the Iranian guy that I attracted last night, me and my wife. You know, this guy kept coming up to me. You know what he said? I was telling my queen, he kept saying this to me. He said, you're my brother. You're my brother. He, said, he kept saying, I like you. I like you. I didn't know this man from Adam. But he kept saying, I like you. I like you. I like you. You're my brother. I'm like, my goodness, who is this man? And so they began to explain to me how he cooks his fish. And, oh, I hey, He said, I just, I think it was a like milk fish or something, some name. Because this this uh, store I go to, to make this guy, he's, he's from India. And this guy, I mean, he uh, he's a fish connoisseur. He gets fish from, from India. I mean, I'm talking about whole fish with the head and everything still on it, frozen and ready to go. He cut it up and dice it up just like you want. I tell you, that's, I tell you, that's one of my mainstays before I go get my fish from. But I found it very interesting having the conversation with this man. But one of, one of the things he said, because uh, he was talking about this milk fish or whatever, this particular fish, and this fish didn't have scales on it. And I didn't even have to say anything. But my Iranian Muslim friend that owns the place, he said, sir, he said, you can stop it right there. This man doesn't eat that fish. I was like, wow. He, 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 I didn't even have to say anything. This is, this is how your wealth goes before you. I'm telling you, it's beautiful. So he, he's talking to the, so, so my, my, my Indian friend is saying, oh, sir, you don't even have to explain the ingredients to this recipe because this man doesn't eat this particular fish. This, this, this man is Jew. Oh man, this per this this Persian guy, this Iranian guy, his eyes lit up. He's like, oh, you 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 too? He said yes. He, he said yeah. I, you know what he said, Akali? He said yeah. I, I I know about you. He said I I know you are the you 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 are the real. He said yeah. He said you are my brother. And get this, this is what he says. But but first he says this. He says this, Mishpaha. He, he says this. He says well, well why? He said well why why don't you eat this fish? Because he was like puzzled. He was like, my goodness, this, this fish is such a good fish. He's like, well, why can why you not eat this fish? And I just said, listen, when you have a father, right, and your father tells you to do something, do you go up to your father and ask him why? <laughs> oh, he said, he said yeah, I fully understand. But I said, no, it, 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 it's just based on that we're not permitted to eat these foods. And when we're not permitted to eat something, 
then I don't ask why we're not permitted to eat it. I just don't eat it out of respect and uh, and our uh, humbleness. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, I truly respect that. I truly understand that. So, you know, there's certain ways you can explain things. And I'm noticing with some of the comments that came in earlier that, you know, you have to be mindful and careful of this. And some of you are doing this ignorantly, but when you go to a store and you see pork or you see somebody chewing on a pork chop sandwich, you know, you kind of, you got to be careful and mindful and guard yourself of condemning them without thinking that you're condemning them, but you're condemning them. Like you're putting them down like, oh, that's unclean. Oh, don't touch that. And you're like, my goodness, this is this people's staple crop. And you're going to tell them that staple meat. And you're going to tell them, oh, you're making it seem like they, they have some kind of disease because, you know, they touch pork or they eat a pork chop sandwich and you don't eat it. And it's, and it's you know what I mean? you got to be mindful of that. You see, you can't be running around and saying, well, oh, I, I, I can't do that because that's bad. Well, it may be bad to you. But to them, it may be good. You know what I mean? So we have to be careful not to offend anyone. And I know all of you probably have folks around you on your daily basis that's eating pork, eating shrimp, or whatever. But are you going to, is is that the is that the example that you want to leave? Is you want to leave them with an impression of you passing judgment on them? Are you greater than them because you don't do that? Oh, that's unclean. Don't touch and my queen made the perfect statement for you to all to understand that. Is that when you're sitting and you're looking at this meat in the butcher shop, it looks all the same to me when you look at it on the surface, right? You you know, you got to look at the sign and see well, where's the pork from the beef? Where's the pork? You know what I mean? So you have to look at this. You know, some of you, because you have a good eye for meat, you can say, oh, yeah, that, 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 that's pork. I see that pork over there. But it doesn't mean you have to sit here and make a scene and tell everybody under the sun, oh, Oh, don't eat that. That's, you, you know, that's evil meat. you going to hell. That's, you can't eat that meat. That's going to kill you. It's going to shorten your life. Blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Stop. Stop that. Be, because what may be bad for one person may be good for another. But we're not here to pass judgment. And I, I know some of you, you might not think you're doing it, but you're doing it. So I just want to bring it, bring this to your attention so that you can guard yourself against doing this. And don't put, I didn't put the Persian man down because he's going to eat his milk fish or whatever fish that was. It didn't have any any scales on it, so I don't eat it. But, hey, I'm like, hey, man, I, I, you know, I hope you enjoy the I, You know what I asked him? I told him this. I said, well, can I use that same method that you explained to me? on these other fish. Well, you say, man, you can, but it just won't taste the same. He's like, it's just this fish tastes this way, and blah, blah, blah. I was like, wow. And then we got to talking about this one fish, I believe, which I found very interesting. This one fish it, it, over there in the Gulf, over there in that, that you know, that, that, that area that, that, you know, everybody's fighting over right now. And, you know, over in the area where you have the Indian Ocean and where it turns into these particular rivers, there's this one fish that swims in from the Indian Ocean and goes into these rivers. And they were talking about how you don't, you don't, you don't buy that fish when it's in the, in the ocean. But once it goes into the river and it starts to, you know, it, it, it can lay like a hundred eggs. One fish can do this. So what they do is they get this fish during that time when it's in the river, and this fish has this, this most distinct taste that you would ever imagine. And if you if you would catch that fish when it was in the sea, it will have this total taste that is just like, you know, undesirable. And I was like, wow, I find these things very, very interesting. But he said a fish, it can go from a saltwater fish to a freshwater fish. I don't know if you're a fishing enthusiast. I know Rabbi Zakar, if he's in here, he, he, he's one. But uh, I find this very interesting as a fish that can change over like that and go and, and, and be in both extremes. And the better tasting, you know, it didn't taste well in the sea, but when it came into the river, he said the fish has like a sweet taste to it, which I found very, very interesting. Very, 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 very interesting to have this conversation with this man. But the further conversation with this man was quite interesting as well because this Persian man is a, is a jeweler here in San Antonio. He gave me his car. And uh, he saw that my wife was with child, and he said, listen, when, you're, when your wife has a child, you, I have a gift for her. You come to my shop. You come to I mean, hey, he kept saying, I'm your brother. I'm your, I'm your brother. He said, we're brothers. He said, I like you. We're brothers. And then you know what he went on to say, which I found very, very interesting. Remember earlier I told you that this man, he looked just like Hakoi, same just height, everything. And he said this. He said this. He said, you know, 
He said, do you, and, he, and he pulled out this necklace that he had around his neck, and he said, do you know what this emblem means? And I looked at the emblem, and I, I couldn't make this emblem out for nothing. And then he turned it over, and it had some ancient writing on it. Looks like Hebrew mixed with like some Chinese hieroglyph. I mean, very, very old writing on there. And he and he showed me this emblem that's around his neck. He said, "You know, you know what?" He said, "I'm a follower of John." And he said it like this. He said, in his understanding, he said, "You know, John was half Jew, so we're brothers." He didn't keep saying brothers, we're brothers, we're brothers. He said, "You know, John was half Jew, so we're brothers." You know, that's his understanding. I left him to it. But I'm, and I'm sitting here thinking to myself. How many of you know who, who John was? What was John? And, and when we look at family relations, what family was John connected to? Can anybody tell me? He, yeah, 100% Hebrew, but what family of the Hebrew? What, what family did he come from? Which, which one of the tribes? Can anybody tell me? Which one of the tribes? No, we're talking... Which one of the tribes? Yeah, we're talking about John, John the Baptist. Sorry if I if I wasn't more specific. We're talking about the person that they know as John the Baptist. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Right. Right. Now, now, if he was a Levite, right? If John the Baptist, and we know is Levite, and this man is following John, he's a follower of John. I was like, my goodness, I'm thinking to myself, this man is a <laughs> And yes, we all brothers from the same mother. I'm like, this man is a Levite. This man is a Levite. And he kept saying before we even got to that, oh, oh, I like you, I like you, we're brothers. Well, he said, we're brothers. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. I'm over here trying to get my fish with my wife. But he kept saying, we're brothers, we're brothers. So I found that very, very interesting. Very, very interesting people that we attract into our lives. And, it, and, and, and at this particular time, yeah, when we're ready to, you know, bring forth the, bring forth the birth of our son, and guess, guess what I'm going to need? I'm going to need a gold ring. And guess what he does? He's a jeweler. Ruka Shia. Are you putting two and two together, Ms. Bar? Because I sure am. And I firmly believe in life, like I told someone the other day, everything in life happens for a reason. Every single thing in life happens for a reason. Everything. Nothing that happens in life is not by coincidence or accident. When you get beyond that and you can really begin to learn in your journey and truly learn and understand and appreciate every experience that you go through with your relationships, with your, you know, with your relationships on many different levels, with your employer, employee type of relationship, with your job, every aspect of your life. When you try to look and decipher and begin to pull from and extract, like I couldn't talk about, talk about this in this lecture, when you begin to extract, well, what can I learn from this experience that you have going on in your life at this moment? What can I, what can I glean from this? What can I gain from this to take me to the next step or for the next journey and prepare me for, you know, the, the next walk, the, you know, the next direction that I'm going into? Because you're always closing the chapter and then you're opening up another one in your book. That's, that's always. The question is, what's happening between those pages? How are you adjusting and adapting to those things? And truly, if we're going to go through this life, which we are going through it together, Ms. Baha, we need to go through it in a positive way, a positive motion, with positive vibration, positive energy. It, it does you no good, and you sell yourself short if you, desire, if you decide to go through it in a negative fashion. Because what you do is you limit yourself, and then you cannot make your mark. And you miss a lot of marks. And before you know it, your book is just full of, a, full of blanks. And you fill in the blanks, and you shouldn't be. Because all of your affirmations are written down. And you know exactly what you want, what you desire. And you, vis you envision exactly what you want. And you see exactly what you want. And you're playing in your imaginations exactly what you want, how you want it. It's going to come to you that way. But it's very, very important that we always have an assessment on ourselves. To really begin to examine ourselves and look at ourselves. And look at the experiences that we've been through so that we can gain something to go through the next experience. 
so even better. You see? Because you can always get better. Never get to a point to where you say, no, I can't get any better. Or, uh, look, I don't need to come in and walk through this, but oh, never, oh, God forbid. <laughs> come Shiloh or she old. Never, never, never believe that. I never think that. But if you do, then that's your right and your responsibility to do so. But what I want to talk about today is something I think that is very, very important. It's going back to the freedom aspect of the Torah. You'll realize that there's so much freedom within the Torah. But how many of you will agree with me and say that freedom isn't free? For well, anybody, is there anybody in this room that will agree with me? You say, Rabbi Kiva, I totally agree with you. Is that freedom is not free. Christianity will run around here telling you, oh, if you're free, then you're free indeed, and you're free. So you can, you know, do whatever you want to do, and blah, 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 because you're free. But what I want you to understand today, what our books are going to tell us today, right here in our books, is that freedom really is not free. If you're, if you're free, then to get freedom wasn't free for you. you there's an experience that I'm pretty sure all of you can tell me a story about how freedom wasn't free for you. You see? And freedom isn't free. You have to work at freedom. Right? That's something that you have to work at. Now, if freedom isn't free for those of you who are responding, and thank you for responding, to Dara Bob for responding, by the way. If freedom isn't free, then can anybody tell me what does freedom cost? What do you have to pay for freedom? Can anybody tell me? Please. It, it, you know, your opinions would be highly, highly, highly appreciated. Can anybody, t can anybody tell me, well, if, if you say, well, Rabbi, yeah, I truly understand freedom and free. I see the bumper stickers on the back of people's cars and blah, blah, blah. If that's the case, then what do you have to, what's the, what do you pay for freedom? There's a payment for freedom. And, and, and again, it's in our partnership. You can read it right on, right off the Torah. There's a payment for freedom. There's a payment for it. You, there's something that you have to pay. There's payment. And that's what I want you all to think about today. What must be paid for the freedom of the Torah of shame? For the Torah of, of money? Think about that for a minute. Everybody wants the wants to get the attention of the Kohen. Oh, I need this question. Can you help me with this, that, the other, and the third? I need this question. Hey, what about this? What does this mean? How do I do this? Blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Nothing wrong with questions, believe me. I'm not shucking and jiving questions because I think that's highly healthy that you do ask questions. But there is a freedom payment, and that's what I, I titled this lecture today. There is a freedom payment, Ms. Bahar. But today, I'm going to be a storyteller. A lot of you, someone is saying in Torah, uh, Titans that are consequences, gratitude, motivation, and focus. Obedience, all great answers, by the way. I want you to understand this, is that freedom is not free. Freedom has a payment attached to it. It's called the freedom payment. And there's something that must be paid for you to really begin to open, to, for, 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 for the freedom vault to be opened up to you. And imagine this freedom vault. When you open this vault, it's limitless. It's unlimited. You open this vault and it just keeps on going and going and going and going and going. But you got to open that vault to freedom. Now, <laughs> I'm not telling you all to become bank robbers, but that vault needs to be opened. And there's a code to get into that vault, the vault of freedom. Once you're in, you're in, my friend. It, once you in this, you get into this. You, you, you consider it like a country club. Once you once you have membership, it's it's lifetime membership. It's it's eternal membership. And, and, and truly, when you taste this freedom, you don't want to leave it. 
You would never forsake this freedom. And that's bringing me to my next story. Characters have been changed to protect the innocent. Because I believe everybody's innocent outright. <laughs> and in that America system, I don't know how, how it is in the UK, Hakoin, but you're innocent until proven guilty. That's American law. Maybe not Sean will be a lawyer. I don't know. Same there. Okay, to doctor that, I believe. But you're innocent until you're proven guilty. Well, how come majority of society today don't follow that law? And, and give the person the benefit of the doubt of being innocent until proven guilty. As we're dealing with what? We're dealing in this part we're setting up judges. What's the role of a judge, by the way? What does a judge do? Well, hopefully, if he's, he's a judge worth his weight, he's going to dish out right ruling judgments. Judgments is not based on, oh, you got dreadlocks, so you go to jail. Oh, you got straight hair, so you the devil. <laughs> I mean, go figure. You know, but again, you must understand this, Mishpaha, is that when, when, you, when you place yourself in a judgment seat, Guess what happens? You're the first to be judged. This is why, you know, don't put yourself in the judgment seat and let someone appoint you there. Look at the pattern that you see in our books now. Judges were appointed, correct me if I'm wrong, I go eat. You just can't go around in the tribes and say, well, I woke up this morning on the left side of the bed, so I'm appointing myself as a judge. Matter of fact, hopefully all of you are waking up on what side of the bed, on the right side of the bed when you get out of bed, correct? That's what we learned from the Cody, yep, on, on the right side of the bed. So you woke up on the left side of the bed, and you say all of, all of a sudden, oh, uh, 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 I'm going to make myself a judge today. You see? But we see we see this here in North America a lot, within the spiritual, quote-unquote, community of, of, the, of Israel, is that people are appointing and giving themselves positions. If you don't believe me, for those you folks on YouTube, you just look at YouTube, and you'll, you'll be a watcher and a witness to it as well. Is that a lot of people just, you know, they give themselves these titles, but they haven't been appointed. You see, you know, so-called Israel today, majority of them are just running around here like loose chickens, right? There is no control, no, no, no authority, uh, 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 formation. You understand what I'm saying? And you so you get a hush posh of all of this on YouTube. And God forbid if you sit on YouTube all day long listening to all of these different so-called Hebrew Israelite groups, so-called Jews, so-called Israel waking up and blah blah blah, and da 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 and da da da. How many of you know what I'm talking about? When you begin to listen to all these different things. You turn up just like you with eating some of the food that we're not permitted to eat. You're confused, and you get very complicated, like, oh, man. Well, he's saying this. Well, she said you could do this. Well, no, the woman's supposed to do this. The man is this. The man's the king. Everybody else is a slave. White people are the devil. Blah, 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 blah. You go down those rabbit holes, and you just, you know, you bust it, and you're disgusted, and you just so complex. What's another thing that can complex you? Is listening to all of these and tasting all these different bitter waters. And that's what I call all of these different so-called groups out there. With, with no formation back to the ancient practices and ancient ways of our forefathers. You just get a lot of just, just noise. It's, it's not even music. It's just noise. It's not a wonderful symphony. It's just no ones. And what does that do to the individual? It confuses them. And they, they, they confound it. And they cannot make rational decisions. And they make misdecisions, or I would say bad decisions, that are detrimental in their journey. God forbid. So we have to ask ourselves this question. I tell you what, I'm going to speak to you personally this day. I'm sticking with the Kohen from Shiloh or Sheol, and my life has been so benefited for it. My life has changed 365 degrees, opposed to going to Hagee's Church. Well, I'm not knocking you if you still go to Hagee's Church, but you're not going to get your wants and desires met there. You can go there and really get a good laugh. 
Get some good jokey jokes. Get a few goosebumps to go on when they play those hymns. Dance like David. How many of you want to learn to dance like David? If you want to learn to dance like David, go to Hades Church because they do it all the time. Bang, 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 bang. So they call it dance like David. I don't know if David was doing the break dance or what, but I, 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 I'm thinking these roots probably come from somewhere in the Kozar Mountains somewhere. Because I just can't see Yisraelites dancing the way that, <laughs> that, I see little, that, I, that I see some of the Jewish converts do. I just, it just doesn't, it seems like there would be more rhythm, more flow, more. Now, you look at, and, and my wife is getting into this, I'm so happy. She's getting into this belly dancing. Now, you, you look at the Eastern woman dance. Now, I can see that going on. I can see our people dancing like that. Have you ever watched Indian movies and watch how the men and women dance in those movies? Oh, I love it. Hey, I'll tell you a good movie that you can watch. It's an American movie that shows it. Uh, what's the new movie? Uh, Aladdin. How many of you have seen Aladdin with the Will Smith in it? Oh, my goodness. Now, that's how our people dance. I guarantee you that's how they dance. They, they wouldn't. You seen it, Akali? I can guarantee you that's how our people dance. They don't do this. <laughs> they don't do uh, uh, that, that, that stuff look like it come out of Russia somewhere, which it did, right? That stuff come right out of Russia. They got the feet kicking up. I said, I'm pretty sure my forefather David didn't dance like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? He danced just like, just like you see in, in, in that Aladdin movie. That's how our people dance. The women dance the same way. So I'm telling my wife, it's true. I'm truly encouraging. Hey, hey, what about those belly dancing classes? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> let, let, let's get that going. You know? Yeah, but she. She, she, that's, that's one of her desires, and believe me, I'm 110% promoting that desire. <laughs> oh yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's present, believe you, believe you me. So I think it's, it's very important that we do understand these things, this cause. We have a rich history, rich culture, tradition, and we're all still learning, and it's great. You never reach a plateau or a utopia to where you say, oh, that's it, I got it, good. No, no, you continue to progress and continue to move on. And it brings me to the story. I tell you, I'm so happy and grateful and so humble to, uh, to have a relationship with a Kohen like I do. I really am. It's a, a yeah, it, it, it's, 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 it's solid. It's a solid relationship. And I, I want y'all relationship to be that same way on on some on, on 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 many different levels. You know what I mean? Is that you 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 never want to leave and forsake the Kohen. Never. You never want to do that. You know, you never want to. I, I I didn't ask to be a judge, but Hakoni appointed me as a judge. I didn't ask for that. I didn't ask for it. And that and that's the mentality that you have to have. Don't ask for anything. Let it come to you. That's the secret to success. It'll come to you. You don't have to go to it. It'll come to you. Many people miss it because they're too busy out there, you know, trying to get it when they don't know it's already, it's, 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 it's you already. It's already within you. You have it within you. You have the capacity, the ability. It's within you. You don't have to go search for it. And so what the son of Aaron does, the Kohen, our Kohen, Simon Altaf, is he, he, is he, he spends that one-on- How many of you in this room had some one-on-one -on -one time with the Kohen? Anybody? Put up a one if that's you. You had one-on-one -on -one time where he actually, he didn't actually, he gave you something that was already within you. You just had to just go and do it. You see? And that's the point we're getting at. But I want to take you to Stoppers. I have a story I want to tell. To, to, to not be your responses, by the way. That one-on-one -on -one with the Kohen is very important. And all of you have the ability to have one-on-one -on -one with the Kohen family. My question is, why haven't you decided to get some of that one-on-one -on -one time? I mean, that would be at the top of my list, Mishpaha. Is one-on-one -on -one time with the Kohen. That's what I need that. I'm, I'm marking that in. Permanent, permanent ink. Permanent marker. I want one-on-one -on -one time with the Kohen. It's going to be truly beneficial to you to get that one-on-one -on -one time because what he's going to do is he's going to open you up. He's not going to say, oh, well, you're going to run away over here. He's going to open you up, that subconscious within you, and show you how powerful, how strong you really are, how awesome you really are. When everybody around you telling you you look like ugly duckling, duckling he's going to show you that you J-Lo, you Beyonce, you Denzel. And whoever else, I, I don't know these days. But you, that's who you are. 
all the negativity to pull it out of you, extract all that out, and begin to empower self, the subconscious within you. He's going to put you present. He's going to, how many of you needed to be brought to the present? <laughs> you see, you needed to be brought to the present. I think that's important. That was big for me. I needed to be brought to the present. To right at this moment. Not, oh, that woman treated me bad 10 years ago. Or, oh, uh, I'm never getting in another relationship again because of what happened to me in the past. That's the wrong mentality to have, Ms. Bob. That's the wrong placement to put yourself in. Because you get mental, I call this mental stagnation. You see, you, you get mental stagnation. And your mind will just wander in that place and just marinate in stagnated water. Anybody know anything? Is stagnated water good to drink? <laughs> Can anybody tell me? For those of you who took in survival classes, or you've been in the military, and they taught you how to survive off Mother Nature, off the land, off of Mother Earth. Yeah, you may have to throw some pills or something in it if that's last resort. But they're telling you to look for free-flowing water, spring water, some water that's moving. So important. The movement. Society, the whole world are making movements. But are their movements positive or negative? That's relative, right? Based on their, their what? Their desires. What they want for themselves. But you can't run around saying one person, sinner, sinner, chicken dinner. You can't run around calling people, you know, uh, 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 sinners and sinners. When you don't even know what, the, what their marks are. Because their marks might not be your marks. Their desires and wants may not be your wants and desires. So they're sinning just because they're doing something that... You don't you don't think and find is, is is appropriate? That's the wrong kind of mental thought process to have. You need to use your brain for the wonderful tool that is it, it is, that mind. Don't be controlled by your mind, but use that mind as the wonderful device and mechanism that the creator of the heavens and the universe has gave to you. Because it is it's beautiful, but don't let it control you. A lot of folks are mind control, and it's sad to say these past six days of labor that uh, you know people are losing their life behind mental, let's just say fatigue, or not being strong mentally, or not being able to overcome whatever feelings or thoughts that they had about themselves, or about what happened to them in the past, to where they can't move on and establish presence and create an environment for themselves, make an environment for themselves that will be better. So that way they don't have to think about the, the, the misgivings of the past. They can be present and say, I'm whole. I, Lamont, am whole. I, Lamont, am happy. I, Lamont, am peace. Do you feel the power? Say it to yourself. Make it, make it yours. Claim it. Own it. Be it. And you in, you're present. Hakohim's simplified affirmations. You see, to me, less is more. You understand what I'm saying? That's one of my, uh, less is more. You don't have to, I mean, a lot of these people have to jump through all these little hoops. And then you do a lot, but you get little. But my thing is, if we can lessen it, and I see this when I go in, lessen it and you'll get more from it. Some of you have questions about the Torah, you're going to realize how free you are within the Torah. Questions about the Shabbat, you're going to realize how open the Shabbat really is. And it's not restricted. The restrictors are actually off. It's just certain things you're permitted, you're not permitted to do. Certain things you are permitted to do. But there's a lot more things you are permitted to do than the uh, uh, things that you're not permitted to do. And a lot of people think vice versa. Oh, I'm so limited because of the law. Oh, no, no, no. Contraire, mon frere. You're so much freer because of the law. Christianity taught me that the law was dead and that the law limited you. But I'm here to tell you that I fought the law and the law won. <laughs> you 
Bible verse. In the, that's a, a old Texas song there. I fought the law and the law won. You see? <laughs> but again, when you when you make when you really begin to embrace embrace the laws of Moses for yourself, you really begin to see how how far you begin to see how free you are. And you, you, you'll see that your life will be changed. How come he's saying, it's, it's very simple in Shabbat, you are free to move around. Would you urinate and put the smell in your house, or would you go quite far from your house? Think about it. It makes so much common sense, but when you're under mind control, that puts you in restriction. And all you think about is the restrictions. And what man has told you that you're restricted on. Don't do this. Don't, because you're going to go to hell. You God's not going to like you. You're going to hell. So what you want to do is prevent yourself from going to hell. And so they leave you in the sphere. Before you know it, fear turns into weakness. Weakness turns into misdecision. Misdecision turns into a bad decision. Bad decision turns into hot mess. You see? I go he said there was no plumbing back then. Correct. So I don't know, nobody going to stay in their house and do some number two all in their house while you're trying to sleep right, you know, on the next wall, on the, on the, on the next, the, the wall to the east, and they pooping in the west. There's not enough potpourri to go around to deal with that excrement. I'm not trying to get graphic on you, but, I mean, just imagine that stuff. That's not cool. And of course, they will think two million people. <laughs> Two million excrement. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. We're not trying to do that. Anybody with any logical sense will tell you. He said, I remember because I was a, I was a medic in the army, and we had to go deal those, uh, uh, dig those holes and the urinals and make them out in the middle of the desert. And believe me, they were so far away from camp, I mean, we had to use lights to get out there, to, you know, because we didn't want any diseases like dysentery. That was a big thing that kicked, kicked out out there in the desert while we were out there. Everybody was getting dysentery. You wonder why, huh? Because they weren't washing their water. No one, they weren't washing their hands after they take care of their business, and they're going to put their finger in their mouth, eating their food, and blah, blah, blah. Oh, it, it's, it's, it, it's all downhill from there. So these things are very, very important that we do understand, Mr. Hall. Now, back to my story. Now, I'm going to, the name is going to be changed to protect the innocent. Here's, a, here's another story. Uh, storytelling today, which I think is very, but this is true story. True story. Uh, this is a story about this man who really had an affinity and love for the court. Really did. He said it with words. Uh, sometimes he would do it with his actions, but it was more words than action. And he would go to the court he for attention. He wanted attention from the court on instruction on what to do, how to do it. You might be saying, Rabbi, are you talking about me? No, I'm not talking about anybody, but I'm just, this is a, this is a story. The names are changed to protect the innocent. So he would go to the Kohen for a particular information and instruction on particular things in his life. The son of Aaron would give instruction. Instruction was given, okay. So he comes to the judge. Nobody, nobody put him in chains to do so. He comes to the judge on his own free will. He comes to the judge to the priest, to the prophet, because I don't know if you all would agree with me, but I would, I'll agree with myself, is that, you know, the son of Aaron, how cool he is all that wrapped up in one today. You don't believe he's a prophet? <laughs> you know, go go read the un unmask Unmasking the End Time Beast, World War III series. Go read it. You'll realize he's a prophet. So you begin to see, so so he comes to the Kohen for, for advice and assistance. And instruction. How many of you have come to the Kohen for advice, assistance, and instruction? Anybody? Anybody in this room? You have one time or another, you see, because this story, I, I want you to not put yourself in its place, but I really want you to understand the story. This is very, very important because the story has a connection. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's going to all connect. We're going to connect the pieces here. Okay, so what three people have. Stop your responses, by the way. Don't be shy about saying that you. Come to the Kohen at one time or another in the form of an email, in the form of a phone call, in the form of asking a question on Power Talk for some instruction, some guidance. Come on, Miss Bob, don't go to sleep on me. You know, 
Stand up for your Kohen. Don't be ashamed to say that, yeah, I've done it. My goodness. Don't be ashamed. Don't let us sleep this year. I know. I know. It's getting late. But stay with me here. Don't be ashamed. Nothing wrong. You know, you're not going to, if you believe, believe in conspiracy theories, you know, the, the Illuminati is not going to come lock you up and put you in one of, the, in, in one of these concentration camps that they're building over here to collect all the people and gas and blah, blah, blah. And Illuminati not going to come get you if you say, oh, you had conversations with the Kobe. Oh, so, yeah, you, you, you are, what do they call that? They're, oh, we got you on the red list. Oh, they got this list of red list people, and you're red list or a black list or some list, and they're going to come pick you up. Don't believe all that mumbo-jumbo. That's fear factor. That's the same with all that hell foolishness. That's the fear factor to keep you down, to lessen you, to prevent you from fully fulfilling the desires that you want in this life. That some people just take for granted because they take their life. I don't for whatever reason. Some people have mental issues. Some people can't get past you know, past experiences. This is why I encourage you all to be present this day. So you don't reside in the past. Don't make the past your domicile. Make the present your domicile. So presently, what do you want for yourself, you see? So I'm going to keep it in the present. So this man comes to the Kohen with questions, wanting instruction. Not, not just one time, many, many times. Our Kohen has given out instruction many, many times to this man. Many, many times. 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 The man in all his humility, he gives thanks for the Kohen. He raises up the Kohen and says really, really nice words. He puts a lot of air out there, a lot of air. Remember the lecture I did on air and action? There's a big difference between putting a lot of air out there and then action. Taking action to the air, you see? And you're going to run into people like this because I want you as students of humanity to understand this. There's going to be a lot of people that come in your life that you attract to you. Because believe it or not, you attract people to you. Do you, do you know that? Do you believe that? You attract people to you. It's not by a coincidence that I, I ran into a Persian guy because I didn't run into him. I attracted him. I attracted this man to me. And the universe has had everything aligned for this to happen at this time. For many different reasons. And I'm truly thankful for that. And this is how I want you all to see your experiences as well. There is a reason why these particular people are coming into your life. How many of you believe in angels and unawares? I tell you, I'm a believer in that. Because I'm telling you, my father used to pick up people on the side of the road. I don't know how, this was back in the day. This was like back in the 80s and the 70s. But my father used to literally pick up people on the side of the road. And I kept, man, for the life of me, I couldn't understand why is my father picking up these people on the side of the road. We have so I mean, in the middle of the night, he'll pull over on the side of the road and just pick up somebody. I don't know if this is common in the UK, but I have seen some movies where, you know, hitchhiking is pretty, it's common. Like, okay, yeah, get in. Where you going? I'll take you there. Blah, blah, blah. Maybe this is just in the movies. But, you know, so my father would just pick up people. I mean, if they're on the side of the road or got their thumb out, oh, hey, get in. Where you going? Well, I'm going this far. I'll take you this far. Blah, blah, blah. Drop them off. And I'm telling you, some of these times he'd pick up these people and he'd drop them off. And I'm looking in the back because we had one of the big old good time bands back in the day. With the TV all in there. Because my father used to love to travel. He used to love to travel. So he put them in the front seat. Of course, we had to go to the back out of respect. And because my father said so. And we didn't ask why, by the way. And so we drop these people off, you know, and he said, okay, well, this as far as I can take you, so, he, you know, the person would get out. And sometimes I would look back, and I couldn't see nobody. I'm like, well, where did that man go? I mean, there's no, uh, the, 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 I mean, flat, flat, we're looking at flat uh, 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 surface, not like he dipped into a ditch or, you know, I mean, I'm looking back, and I see nothing. I'm like, wow. My father, you know, he, you know, he's all about his business. He's driving, so. He's really not paying any attention. So you, you you must understand this as well. 
people in your life come to you, it may be for a reason. And sometimes you could be entertaining an angel and you don't even know it. So this is why it's very, very important that you have your best foot forward and be on best behavior when you deal in in relationship with other people. Some of us had to learn. I can remember back in the day seeing responses come in here. You, know, you had to learn how to be nice to people. Because in your upbringing, you were conditioning, you were conditioned not to like certain people. Either but because of their color, because of the way they talk, because of the way they dress, because of the, you know, the texture of their hair. But you got over that, right? And you you grown to really just say, okay, yeah. On face value, you know, I, I'm not prejudging you or putting you or profiling you or putting you in somebody's class just because of whatever. And I haven't even talked to you. You see? I haven't even sat down and reasoned together with you. To even have animosity or even have a hatred, which I don't have, or even to try to understand you. I see why. And I told this to Nicole the other day. I see why at the top of your list is relationship. I understand that. I truly do understand that. And do you understand it too, Ms. Baha? Relationship is so very important. Because relationship can not only affect you, but affect the other person. And we do live in a social, <laughs> in a social world where we're social creatures. Should be. Hope none of you are just, you know, locked up in the four walls of your house. That's just not a way to live. That's not a way to be. We're social creatures. Me, I socialize at the Costco, or at the Walmart, or at the Sam's, because they're giving away free food. We strike up a little conversation. I got a friend. That's what he does for lunch. He doesn't. He don't. He don't buy his lunch. He'll go to Sam's. And he'll just sit there, and he'll 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 eat off the little vendors. You like, yeah, I'm full now. Okay, that's good. But he he'll strike up a conversation, and he just begin to talk to him. Before you know it, he's still had a, a full course meal. So you know, we we have to understand this: is that you know we're social people. You can't put yourself in a bubble and extract yourself from this very world that the Master Yeshua put you and placed you in to be a light to. Why are you trying to extract yourself out of this and say, I don't want a part of the world? I understand it, and I get it for a minute. Because Christianity will tell you to what? That you must separate yourself from the world. Am I correct? How many of you got that teaching? It's that, oh, you must segregate yourself from the world. I got that teaching in Christianity. No. You, what do they say? They use, this, they use this terminology. Don't be worldly. How many of you heard that terminology before? Oh, don't be worldly. Well, I'm one of them supposed to be alien. No, don't, don't, don't be worldly, brother. That, that, that's worldly. That's worldly. It's almost sound like you got some kind of disease, the worldly disease. You, you're worldly. No, I'm in this world. I was brought into this world. So why wouldn't I be worldly? You see? We're supposed to be helping out humanity, helpers of humanity, light to humanity in their darkness. But uh, uh, how am I supposed to connect with the world when you're telling me to disconnect? And some of you don't understand this, but maybe you're doing the same thing. But you don't, ignorantly, you don't see that you're doing it. As you're disconnecting yourself from the world that you're supposed to be connecting yourself to and be that beacon of a light. So that they can, you, you will draw people to you. Remember we talked about attracting people to you? Those energies come, you attract certain people, they'll just be drawn towards you. But many folks, when you come around, it's like, you know, turning the lights on and the cockroaches just begin to run. You turn the lights on, the what the cockroaches, they go and hide. What are they looking at, under your refrigerator? Can they go inside your cabinets and stuff? No, you don't want to be that. You want to be polar opposite of that. This is why you have to leave negativity at the door. So back to the story with this man in the Kohen, which I think is very, very important, very, very instructive, you see. The story of assistance from, 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 a, from, from a Kohen, the story of assistance. 
So it's made in stomach for assistance. Fly time again. Assistance is given. Assistance is given. Some assistance he acts on, some he doesn't. And this goes on for a cycle, for a while. This, 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 this type of behavior. He keeps asking questions. Nothing wrong with asking questions, by the way. But he keeps asking questions, getting, a, getting, getting instruction. And sometimes acting on it, sometimes not. Now this goes on for a while. Now it comes to a climax. It comes to a time when assistance is being given out and there's no, let's just say, let's just say uh, no compliance with the instruction. They, to where it gets to the point where, you know, my goodness, I mean, how much longer are you going to talk to somebody and they don't follow through, but they continue to want to talk to you? You know what I mean? And they continue to want to get instruction, but the instruction that they've been given, they haven't followed through with it. And it's like they don't want to follow through with it. And and, more, and, 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 and everything that you present to them, they reject it. It's, it's not, that's not right. Uh, that, no. So it's like they want a different answer. But the answer is already right in front of them. But the, that answer, in their mind, is not good enough. But they get the answer from the judge. The judge has given the verdict. But you find the verdict is not right. That you don't want that verdict. So what do you do? You want to do a retrial, right? You go to a jail, you want to retry the case. So you come and you retry the case, and the same is presented to you again, right in your face. But you, you reject it. You deny it. You come up with an excuse why you can't do this, blah, blah, blah. Listen to this story. And then it comes to a point to where you go to the judge again. And then the judge just looks at you like, why are you here? Or you go to the doors of the judge, and you know how the gates, it talks about the gates. you got to have a judge in your gate. But what if you go to the gates, Mr. Bahar, the gates are closed? <laughs> Matter of fact, for you, the gates are locked up. What does that mean, Mr. Bahar? Think about that for a minute. Yet, time and time and time again, folks, for some other, for some odd reason or another, think that they know better. Yet they come for assistance, and it goes back to the title of this lecture. He said, "If you want, if you truly want freedom, and you come to the, you you come for assistance. You come, you come to the judge. You come to the." to the prophet. You come to the priest. Yet, yeah. you, 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 you come for assistance and you don't take action on the assistance that's given properly. Remember I told you, freedom has a price to it. What do you pay for freedom? All of you gave some great answers. What is the payment for freedom? Because to me, you could sum up free. Our way of life is freedom. See, our way of life is not a religion. So if you're in here thinking that this is a religion, you're in the wrong place. But stay put, because then you'll begin to understand is religion is where you don't want to be if you truly want to be free. But you must understand that freedom has a payment to it. And just like this man... You, you come to the gates of the judge and the gates of the, the, the gates are closed to you? Wow. Think about that for a minute. Imagine if that was you. You had been coming to the gates, gates wide open, come on in, my friend, come on in, come on in. And then you come this time and the gates are closed. What would that make you want to do? Maybe it would make you want to reassess yourself and say, well, wait a minute. What did I do wrong to where the gates are closed to me? You punch in the code to the gates to the, you know, the judge. Your code is, is invalid. You, 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 you can't get in. It's not working. Wait, wait a minute. The gate, I put in these, oh, 777, that normally opens it up. Well, 777 is no longer opening up for you. So maybe you need to go to 711 now because 777 doesn't work anymore. Why can't I get in? Why don't I, why don't I have access? How I many of you want access to the Creator? 
How many of you want access? I'm telling you, I want to be a part of the country club with unlimited membership. Unlimited membership, Mr. Hall. That's what I want. I don't want temporary membership. I don't want a six month. I don't want a three month membership. I want unlimited membership. To where I can have access. Because I don't know when I'm going to need access, but isn't it good to have that access, that, you know, that access card to where if I do need it, I can get in the gates. And the gates are always open to me. Because believe me, Ms. Barr, I've seen it for myself. You know, it gets to the point where the gates are closed on you. Don't let that be you. To where you don't have access. And then you, you ask yourself, well, why don't I have access? Why am I restricted? Why can I not get in? And you start to point the finger. Hopefully you're not pointing the finger at nobody but yourself. Well, what do I need to change? What do I need to do? Freedom has a, it's the, the payment freedom. We're going to talk about it in a minute. The, the payment for freedom. How many of you in this room can agree with me that Torah is freedom? The laws of Moses is freedom. I call he talked about it in his lecture. He talked about it being the default. He said, you, <laughs> you got to get back to the default. Where is freedom? I mean, a lot, a lot of religions have cropped up since the, the penning of the, the first five books. And I'm pretty sure all of you will agree with me on that. A lot of religion has popped up after that. But we don't, we're not here for religion. We're here to learn how to live and live a life that's more of infinitely abundant. That's what I'm here for. Whatever, what makes me happy? What are my desires? What do I want? And I see them all becoming fulfilled. Just like everybody said, you just tick them off and tick them off and tick them off. And then you, you'll find that your energy will begin to attract certain people to you. And you'll realize because your loyal loyalty comes to you. Because you happy, happiness comes to you. Because you're full of joy, joy comes to you. Because you're just a, 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 a wellspring of peace. Peace comes to you. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And I'm not just speaking words here. This is powerful stuff. And it just comes to you. And it comes to you. And it comes to you. I've never heard my mother say this before. But my daughter told me this the other day. She said, Dad, I'm at peace. I was like, hallelujah. She's like, Dad, I'm at peace. This girl, Chinese girl, she comes to me and she said, Dad, I'm at peace. How many people in China can say that? Much less from Hong Kong. <laughs> my goodness. She came to me and she said, I am at peace. And now she's starting to get it, Mr. Hart. Fifteen years old, and she's starting to get it. And the light bulb is coming on, I go in. And she said, you know what, Dad? And she reads a lot of books. She's a reader. She's an avid reader. And she said, see, you know what, Dad? And she said, you know what, Dad? I understand that if I'm, pe if I'm at peace, everything around me will be peaceful. But if I'm not at peace, then everything around me won't be at peace. And I'm like, Michelle. And she said, she said, I said, yeah, that's right. Now you get it. She said, so how how I am on the inside affects everything around me. I'm like, yeah, you get it. There you go. That's great. Books don't tell you that. <laughs> You learn that from within yourself. You see, because now you're getting to know yourself, your subconscious, the inside of you. And now it's coming out. See, that's what's coming out of you. Peace is coming out of you. That's beautiful. I was like, wow, that's great stuff. <laughs> I go and say, I'm calling the devil's out of peace. <laughs> and King Kong is out there. Oh, indeed, I go here. Simha, she bought you peace. She's saying, uh, 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 for food for thought. Th th these Torah feast days are gifts to Israel that open gates of heaven to knowledge and understanding, wisdom via Hakohi. The Teshuvah, the repentance of self analysis to, to recognize hidden areas in our life that need to be self correction uh, to improve one's self thinking, 
to do good works in daily living. Our thoughts are seeds for the rest of the year with Torah feast days. Food for thought, wisdom. The way to comply with Torah people, with Torah people have uh, uh, other other people uh, to choose to do good works. Stop with that response. Uh, your statement there, uh, Simha, truly appreciated, truly taken and noted as well. It's very, very important that you understand. And I want, I want to tell you something. I know how Koyas he's going to be in travels. Now, I don't know, any of you who have been here for a while, I, I want to encourage you to look at this point. Is that when Akoyi goes away, you know, from America, what I've noted, from America, and even in other travels as well, when he was traveling from the UK, he would always get revelation. Revelation, or let me put it this way, maybe he's already had the revelation, but he was given the permission to open the revelation to the family. You understand what I'm saying? So I would encourage you to look for these things to happen during these times. Be on the lookout for that. And I'm, I'm, I'm giddy over here and excited about uh, uh, what's ahead for the family and what, what, what new truths and these hidden mysteries, because believe me, our, our spirit, our way of life, our, our spiritual way of life, our books have mysteries that we're opening up and that you're beginning to see that. You're beginning to peel away at these, these layers and layers and layers of, of like Simhoff about the wisdom and, and the understanding and the knowledge about how we're supposed to live our lives. Not about some heaven and the by and by, but how you're supposed to live your life right now. To benefit yourself to benefit your families, and to leave a legacy of, 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 of spiritual inheritance that, that far surpasses any generation was ever left for you. You understand that? I see that within my own family. I mean, the groundwork is laid. The foundation is, man, my goodness, for some great things ahead for our children and our children's children. It's beautiful, isn't it? You are a generation. As you can see, I'm not a big numbers person. I don't, I don't really care for the room. Me and I go in. Me, but many folks don't stick around for this kind of stuff because they they want it and we're not, not here. It just isn't. And and they want to be. Let's just say people want to be. What's the best word I can use for this? People want to be pleased without payment. They, they, they want the pleasure, but they don't want to go through the pains. And I wouldn't call it pains, but they, they, without, without, without paying for it. I couldn't even tell you about the rabbi there in, 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 uh, uh, over there in the uh, Philippines. You want something, you want, but you don't, you're not putting the the energy you want is not the energy that you're putting out. Let me put it that way. Does that make, see, the en energy that, you, that you're putting out, this is why energy is so important. Because everything around you is based on energy. Anything that you want right now in your affirmations and on your vision board, there's energy behind it. You see? So you have to match that energy to bring it to you. The matching makes it attractive. That's that attraction. It's beautiful when it happens. I saw it happen with this Persian guy. I was like, wow, this guy from Iran. And he told me. He told me there's no good restaurants here in San Antonio. He said, he said you know, there's some Iranian restaurants, but they're not authentic. And he said, you would know that because you have a Chinese wife. He said, this is not Chinese food here. I said, yes, sir, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I said, sir, you're absolutely right. This is not Chinese food. Interesting, another point of note. He also told me this. He said, their diet over there in Iran, the Persians, they like to eat fish almost every day over there. But he said, since he's been in America, he eats it like three times out of the week. 
But he he was buying how can we trucks load of fish. He said he said how can I have two fr freezers? <laughs> A freezer for my fish. They're big fish eaters. They love to eat them. First love, because you said I'm interested in the fall festival and would like to keep it. Okay. Make sure that book, Ursula, that's going to break down the festival to you and, and the practicality in 18 on how to keep the festival. That's going to really help you out tremendously. You can purchase that book on Amazon or you can get it on uh, Lulu, L-U-L-U, -L -U, if you want a hardback copy. But if paperback is suffice for you, can get it on Amazon, okay? The Feast of Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel. Great book to pick up on the festival. Great book to jump through all these little hoops and and do all these restrictions that Judaism have you in to keep the festival. You can actually keep the festival and really, you know, with pleasure and with joy and with peace and with love behind it. And not working at keeping the festival. My goodness, I never worked so hard in my life. There you go, Ursula. Hakoim posted it for you. For that, get into the Torah because I want to read from the Torah a little bit so we can get the answer to the question. Because I know all of you say, "Well, Rabbi, Rabbi Kiva, what's the answer to the question on payment? What's the what's the what's the what's the freedom payment? Because there is a payment, Mishpah. There's a payment. There is a payment. You see, our Torah tells us what we must pay for freedom. Our Torah does tell us this. Now, everybody likes to quote this verse, and I know you read it earlier, but Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 20, talks about, again, I read from the Abrahamic faith Bible. So if you have any other Bible student of, of God and you want to learn more about what God wants you to do, add the Abrahamic faith Bible to your libraries. It will truly help you out. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 20, justice, justice, justice you will pursue, that you may live and inherit the land which Yahweh your power gives you. Now, today, everybody, Lottie Dottie, and their mama think that they're giving out proper justice. Right? How many of you this day consider yourselves having the ability to give out justice? Anybody? Anybody? What is justice to you anyway? If I ask you, Mishpaha, what is justice? What would you say? Torah says it twice here. It says justice, justice. But what is justice to you if I ask you, Mr. Hall? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Not a stab at it. You're not trying to eat it or do harm to it. But anybody want to, anybody want to take a guess? What does justice mean to you? Anybody want to give an educated opinion? Because all of your opinions are educated. When I say justice, what does that mean to you? In America, they run around here protesting saying, no justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. How I many you heard that before? My goodness, that just uh, gets on my nerve. No justice, no peace. The Messiah said justice meaning right ruling. Right ruling what? Right ruling, what does that mean? If you're talking to a Christian and say right, right ruling, you don't confuse them already. And you're leaving them more complex. <laughs> you're leaving them more complex than they were before. So when you say justice, what does that mean? Proper instructions. What does justice mean to you? The acts of kindness and compassion in the Torah. Respect uh, of others' freedoms. What uh, uh, is it? What you is? It is what you do. You receive. Hey, Simonis, that's good. It is what you do. You receive. Justice. What does justice mean to you? All oh, these are good responses. Educated opinions. You know, good responses. There's no wrong one. A fairness, Hadassah says. Uh, well, do not hurt the, the normal, will not hurt, will, will not do hurt to the normal man. Okay, I see that. Justice. What does justice mean to you? Justice, justice. You will pursue. You see, you all are making some great statements. Because when you look at the rest of the world, they're not looking at justice. They're looking at judgment. And so you have to be careful not to put yourself in the judgment seat. But you can put yourself in the justice seat. You must pursue justice. This is what I told you earlier. 
change the names to protect the innocent. Because you're innocent until you're proven guilty. And I'm not trying to prove you guilty at this moment. So I find you innocent. You must pursue justice. Not judgment. But you've got to be careful because you can be judgmental in your statement. And how you say things. Oh, you don't do that. That's bad. Well, that may be good to them. Don't tell them that that's bad. You understand me? See, the ignorantly, you could be passing judgment on somebody when you need to be delving out and pursuing justice. You understand what I'm saying? My sister comes to visit me. We go out and eat, and she orders the biggest pork chop sandwich in the world, and I pay for it. That's justice. I'm not sitting here going to judge my sister because she likes to eat the biggest pork chop sandwich in the restaurant. I don't give a flying flu. If my sister's happy eating the biggest pork chop sandwich in the whole of the world, in the whole of San Antonio, Texas, then I'm super happy for her, super excited, full of joy, full of peace, full of happiness for my sister. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, but some folks, oh, oh, I, I can't buy you that pork. That's unclean. you going to hell. What is that? That is judgment. It is a judgment, judgment that you shall pursue. Careful now. Bring it closer into your homes. Show that same justice towards your, your spouse, your significant other, that girlfriend, that child, that family member, that friend, that loved one. Pursue justice. Oh, but he gay, Rabbi. You know, you know, you know what the Bible say. Ooh, I, I, I'm many times heard, Rabbi. You know what the Bible say about them gay people. What, what does the Bible say? What are you saying about the gay people or transgender people or whatever title they want to give themselves to not offend them? Because I'm not trying to offend nobody. I love all of y'all. You see. But too many times, we must guard ourselves and not put ourselves in the judgment seat. But we need to put ourselves in the seat of justice. What is justice? Beat everybody. You guys gave some great responses. And stop with those responses, by the way. You be kind to all people. I don't care if they overweight lovers or if they knee high to a tadpole or if they thin, thinner than thin, or if their hair is straight or curly. Or if they smell bad or smell good, or if they brown or pink or yellow or green, it doesn't matter. You give, you delve out the same love and kindness, the same compassion, the same love, the same positive energy. Because I, Lamont, am positive energy. Wow, that's powerful. That's pop. I like that. It's not rebuttal. That's powerful stuff. And that's what you need to do. And that needs to be your makeup. That's when you let your light shine. Not when you say, oh, uh, no, I, I can't go out and eat with you because you're a sinner and you're going to hell. Oh, no, no, you're not, oh, you don't believe in Yeshua, you're going to hell. Oh, uh, you eat those shrimp over there? I'm not, I'm, I can't buy you that shrimp old boy sandwich. You understand what I'm saying? That's judgmental. But to show justice, and you you buy them, you buy them that the the that pink dinner. You let them drink that pink water. If they're happy, Fukushima. That makes them happy. Because you, you're doing just like our forefather, the father of our way of life. He always leaving the door open. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Abraham. But always leaving the door open. You too. You can begin to empower yourself by leaving the door open. And don't close the door to the people that's around you in your relations, in your relationships. It's so easy to match them. Like for like. Oh, you going to give me hatred? I can hate back. You going to drink the hater ray? I'll drink the hater ray who? You going to cuss out my mama? I'm going to cuss out your mama. What are you going to get with that? I remember, I remember in the neighborhood... We used to play as children. Man, you start talking, you talk about my mama, I'm going to talk about your mama, and then what happens after that? Piss the cups, right? You all know the scene. You, you all know what's going to happen. I mean, that's what happens. So who wins at the end of the day? Nobody. 
because I still don't talk about your mama. You talked about my mama, and then you know it's it's battle royal after that. It's Mr. Cubs. You know we fight. Don't talk about my mama. I told you don't talk about my mama. You see what I mean? So you don't have to match life for life. Now, in my adult relations with the opposite sex, I'll tell you this. There would be confrontations, and, you know, these women in my life would try to push me to the that festivity button that I talked about. They would, they would hit those, they know the exact words to you. And then they would repeat them and repeat them and repeat them before you know the meter keeps going up, that festivity meter starts going up and up and up. And then you know what I would do? You're like, oh, how about what you do? Did you hit her? Did you? And then, then, then the cell phones would start flying, break against the wall, you know, start breaking things. I'm like, wow, this is really getting serious. And I, oh, while all this is going on, I'm just keeping my peace. I'm keeping my peace. I'm keeping my peace. I'm like, can we not talk like two grown folks? I mean, why, why does it have to, you know? And, and you get all the expletives coming at you. And then the climax is, is that I get in my car and then I go away. And then in a, when all that's going on, I'm, everything's being hurled at me. You this, you that, you a punk, you this, you you weak, you, you. I'm like, how am I weak when I'm not, I didn't even put my hands on you. So I'm strong if I hit you. I'm strong if I throw your cell phone against the wall and break it. That makes me strong. I'm like, my goodness. We're on like two different levels here. So you have to what? You have to extract yourself out of the situation. How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? You extract yourself out of that environment. And you push yourself further and further away, farther away, as further away from that environment as you can. So that you can keep your peace. So you can keep your joy. And that you can keep your right mindset, your right framework, so that you can do what's right. And so that you don't get judgmental and you can show justice. Justice is what's important. That's the key. Let's continue reading on. We're going to need to wrap it up here. We're going to, go, we're going to begin to read from Deuteronomy chapter 17, which I think you've already read, chapter 17. We're going to start at verse 8. I call he read this, but I just want to highlight on a few things that he read. And if there is a matter that is too hard to you, for you in judgment, between blood and blood, between plea and plea, between stroke and stroke, being matters of controversy within your gates, then you shall rise up, get up into the place which Yahweh your power shall choose. Look at verse 9. And you shall come to the Kohanim, the Levim, and to the judge that shall be in those days and inquire, and they shall show you the sentence of judgment. I want you to highlight verse 10. Here is the key. What? Wait a minute, it's going to be verse 10? No, verse 10 is one of them you need to highlight. Here we go, let's read verse 10. And you shall do according to the sentence, which they, of that place, which Yahweh shall choose, shall show you. Wow. Remember I talked about the man that kept going back? This is, this is kind of where it went kind of fickle for him here. He didn't do all according to the sentence, the decree, the instruction. And you shall, listen to this, Torah, I mean, this is black and white, and you shall observe to do all, to do according to all that they inform you. Okay, cut and dry. No mystery here, Mishpaha. Look at verse 11. According to the sentence of the Torah, which they shall teach you, according to the judgment, which they shall tell you, teach and tell, teach and tell. The Torah is going to teach and tell, he's going to teach and tell you. That's a lecture. You know, you remember you used to play that game, show and tell? Well, it's Torah. Right. This is no game. This is real life, way of living. You teach and tell. That's what a judge would do, and that's what your Kohen, that's what your prophet would do for you. He's going to teach and tell you. you you're not going to just go in and have, have faith. You're not going in and have faith, Miss Baha. You're going to be taught and told, teach and tell, teach and tell, right out of the Torah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mother Earth. And you shall not decline from the sins which they shall show you. To the right hand or to the left. Okay. So, so again, something is presented to you. Man, maybe something is even brought to you. Yet you reject it like the man. You reject You say, no, no, no. 
Uh, you come up with all kinds of, you know, no, no. Uh, maybe you need to bring me some milk. Some other brother. Oh no, maybe you need to bring me some milk. Well, when is when is the, when is your well going to run out and something else is not going to come to you anymore? Because you keep rejecting. Because you keep declining, like Torah said, you shall not decline from the sinners which they shall show you to the right hand or to the left. Here is verse twelve that needs to be highlighted. Here is the payment for freedom. Right here in verse 12. And we're going to get ready to close with verse 13. But look at verse 12 of Deuteronomy chapter 17. And the man that does not pay what? Anybody? Can anybody write that and text that again? Because I want you, I want to get this etched in your stone. This is the payment. Remember say you got to pay something for freedom? Torah's telling us right here. What do you have to pay? Can anybody write that in for me? What do you have to pay for those of you who read along with me? And the man that does not pay what? Attention, Eddies. Thank you. Pay attention. Pay attention. And I'm telling you, this is the payment for freedom. Here it is right here. The payment, the freedom payment is to pay attention. I go to his whole lecture. I can sum it up and do this. Is that you must pay attention, Israel. Family, pay attention. Do you see it, Mishpaha? Torah, I told you Torah is going to tell us plain as day, black and white. What is the payment for freedom? It's for Israel to pay attention. It's for the Hebrews to pay attention. It's for the world to pay attention. The man that does not pay attention, and, and get this, it's a little rhyme to it, to pay attention and will not listen to the Kohen, the priest that stands to minister there before Yahweh power, or to the judge, even that man shall die, and you shall put away the evil from Israel. Remember I was telling you about the man? Why do you think he went to those gates and the gates were closed? Because if you don't want to pay attention, it's like you're evil. You don't want to listen. Woo-wee! I didn't say that Torah did. If you don't want to pay attention and listen, this is the payment. You think, well, oh, i got to come out of my wallet. No, you don't. This payment is paying attention. You must pay attention. There's no number value on this. Because some, some, some of the first things folks will say, well, I, I can't afford to pay attention. Am I right? I've heard some, some guys around here joke. Have you ever heard this joke? They'll say, man, I'm so poor, I can't pay attention. You ever heard that joke? I hear many guys saying that. And guess what, Akohim? they so poor that they can't pay attention. Words are super powerful, aren't they? I'm telling you, you take Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 12, and you highlight it, circle it in your Bible, do whatever you have to do. The man that does not pay attention. What's the payment? You have to pay attention. That's what you have to pay. Do you see it, Ms. Paul? That's the payment for freedom. Now, if you don't want to pay attention, what's the reverse of that? If you don't want to pay attention, what can you expect? Can anybody tell me? If you don't want to pay attention, you don't want to pay for freedom, what can you expect to be? Not free, right? That's the opposite of being free. Not free. Still in chains and bondage. Shackled. Slave. Did you see it? Yet a lot of folks, for you students of humanity, how many of you right now consider yourself a student of humanity? For you who's a student of human nature, You'll, sit, you'll say to yourself, not put yourself in a judgment seat, but just looking at justice, you'll say, man, there's a whole bunch of people running around here that's not free. I see them. Yeah, they're walking and talking, they're driving their cars, but they're not free. You have friends, family members, and loved ones just like that. And you look at them and then you examine them and you're like, wow, these people truly are not free. Yet they say they're free. Oh, I'm free. I'm free indeed. But you examine their life and you sit back and watch them and you realize how not free they are. 
And yes, they may be paying attention, but here's the kicker. They're not listening to the Kohen. They listening to Haiti. You understand what I'm saying? So when they're paying attention, again, it's, it all goes back to who do you listen to? You see? And so they're paying attention, but the, the source of who they're paying attention to has no power behind it. You know what I mean? So nothing gets accomplished. So they still, thus, still in what? They're still unfree, in bondage, miserable. Always with all the questions but no answers. All this negativity in their lives. Everything seems to be going wrong around them. And the seriousness, if you really break down Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 12, they cannot break it down, Mishpaha. Look how... Look Look at the consequences of not paying attention and will not listen. Look at the end of that verse. I mean, is that heavy stuff, Mishbaha? That is heavy stuff. Of, these are the consequences of not paying attention and not listening. You're like dead to Israel. Our Torah tells us to put you away. Why? Because maybe this stuff can get contagious. And you don't want it in the family. Do you see where we're going? Maybe you have, remember I talked about, you know, you know, uh, uh, distancing yourself from that drama, from that negativity. I'm getting my car, leave. I don't care what you call me. I'm going to distance myself, you see. That's serious business. Now, I'm not telling you to literally go out there and kill somebody because it's going on, but you need to put them to death. you got to cut them off, close the gate. So you're, you're figuratively dead to me, not literally, you know what I mean? Because I, I can't think the way you think, so I can't think about you. You understand what I'm saying? That, that's, that's the point you got to get to. Otherwise, that will fester, and you don't want that in the camp. You don't want that in your house. It'll fester. And before you know it, those bugs are flying around you. <laughs> the bugs of bondage. <laughs> the bugs of depression. The bugs of anxiety. The bugs of hatred. No, no, you don't want those bugs around you because you're free. You are whole. You are complete. You are health. You are wealth. You are prosperity. But you can't be there with all these other little bugs flying around you. It's trying to bite at you. It's trying to take a bite out of prosperity. It's trying to take a bite out of hell. No, we don't want that, Mishpaha. That's not my desire for none of you to be in that situation. But what I want you to see is what Torah is spelling out for us here, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 12. Is that if you don't, if you got to pay attention. That's, what, that's the payment. You must pay attention. And will not listen to who? To the Kohi, not to Hagee, not to Joel Osteen. This is the thing right here. Even that man shall die, and you shall put away the evil from Israel. Wow. Heavy stuff, right? Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 13. And all the people shall hear and fear and do no more presumptuously. Wow, that's good stuff. You see, because why would this verse begin to say that? Because remember, we talked about this is being like a disease and you don't want it to fester. Let this linger around before you know it. It gets contagious and it spreads amongst the camp. We don't want that, do we? So this is what we have to look at. That's the payment. I gave you that. I gave you the payment right there. That's the answer to my question. That's the payment. The freedom payment is what? Pay attention and listen. Right from the Torah. It's to pay attention and listen. Right from the Torah. Right from the Torah. So there you have it, Mishpaha. I'm going to wrap it up on that note. I'll wrap it up.
I'll wrap it up right there. Hopefully this lecture was uh, instructional to you. I hope you all have a great Shabbat ahead, great six days of labor. Enjoy your families, your friends, your loved ones this day. Have a great six days of labor. And uh, really begin to pay attention. This is real stuff. This is, this is no game for me. For me, it's no game. It's my way of life, my way of living. And I wouldn't change it for nothing in the world. So I'm not going to halfway it. I'm in it 110%. Okay, on that note, we'll wrap it up. If you guys have any questions, you know, please put them out there. Please put them out there, okay? Please put out your questions now to the Kohen. I'm going to turn it over to our Kohen. And, uh, yeah, Shabbat Shalom and Shalom Shalom. I love you and I leave you. And peace, love, and enjoy. To that, uh, Rabbi Kifa. Okay, any questions before we close the room? Uh, just one uh, point of note, uh, I'm going to be leaving uh, America about uh, the third week in September, so please no calls and no SMSs to me, because my phone will be shut down. I will not be receiving any phone calls, nor any SMSs, I won't see them. And the best thing for you to do is to email me to the email address uh, shimon63 at yahoo.com, s-h-i-m-o-u-n-6-3 at yahoo.com. Uh, that would be the best and uh, other than that uh, you know we are going to be hitting a festival season ahead so prepare for your festivals you, you've got time uh, between now till the festivals and make sure you know what, what you need to do and make sure you know you, if you have the forever Israel Sidhus then of course you know you already are clued up you know what to do if you don't have them, I would advise you to get a copy from Amazon. They are available in paperback, in Kindle format, all of those good formats that you can download or purchase and Amazon can deliver to your door, you know, prime delivery, etc. So again, not a problem. Because there are certain prayers, there are certain processes that need to be followed. So they are relevant and need to be followed. So with that, I will uh, say, have a great Shabbat Shalom, North America, and Shalom Shalom, the rest of the world. Tudah. Take care. Till next time.